Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for Space Shuttle Discovery's STS-131 pre-launch news conference. Joining me today is the Shuttle Integration Manager, Mike Moses. Good afternoon. STS-131 Launch Director, Pete Nikolinko. Good afternoon. And Shuttle Weather Officer, Kathy Winters. Good afternoon. We'll hear from the panel and then we'll take questions. Mr. Moses. Thanks, Kendry. Well, folks, good afternoon uh, and welcome to the Kennedy Space Center. We finished up today, uh, it, it, the last in a chain of meetings leading up to this one, but really the first uh, as we head into countdown. So this was the first meeting of the mission management team, the MMT, at our uh, launch minus two day point. It's a standard meeting time that we have where we basically go through to make sure we've closed out everything that we had as we've gone through all our flight readiness reviews and since some time has passed make sure no new issues have cropped up that deserve the team's attention and then I get a status from the teams on what we're looking at with weather and countdown status so uh, a pretty standard template today no no big issues we had uh, a couple items you know leading into into FRR we had a few items heading into the agency FRR we had a few new items um, and heading into this meeting we had uh, two new items that have come up late mostly both in the booster world um, on uh, FSM 17, which is a, a static motor firing that we did out in Utah uh, a couple months ago. Uh, it's a standard plan that we have that every couple of lots where we cast a, uh, a new batch of propellant, we burn off, uh, uh, we build a motor and, and burn it on the ground in a static capture mode out at our ATK facility in Utah, Promontory, Utah. And so we did that test, and then just like we do after we f get a, a set of boosters back, from flight, we tear them apart, inspect every little last inch of it, and do a pretty detailed analysis. So the team was doing that work uh, all along, and in doing it, they discovered some, um, we we'll call it unusual charring on one of the insulators near the forward field joint. If you remember, the solid rocket boosters are built in segments. There's four separate segments that are cast, propellant cast in them. Uh, they're put on a train and shipped here, and then they're mated together, pinned up with a, with a, a joint. And then the forward segment, the forward frustrum is put on, and the aft skirt, which has the, uh, the hydraulic systems and the nozzle uh, uh, control, s the thrust vector control system is put on down here at Kennedy. So, so there's, a, there's a bunch of pieces to this motor. So at one of the joints between two of the segments, the forward propellant segment and then the forward center, the next one, uh, propellant segment, there was some anab abnormal erosion down there near one of the, uh, uh, one of the, the liners. And there's, a, there's a basically a two-and-a-half-inch-ish uh, amount of asbestos-based aligner, uh, ablative, that is put in between the propellant casting and the casing. So that's the insulation between the propellant and the casing. And so that's where they noticed this abnormal charring. So the team did all the right things and, and investigated from a forensic standpoint the signature they saw. And, and in the, the little gap between those two segments, there's some hot gas in there, but it stays stagnant. The main flow uh, of, the pr of the motor, and again, just to back up to solid rocket motor 101, you burn the propellant. It has fuel and oxygen oxidizer built into it as kind of a pencil eraser consistency. You light it on fire effectively and it burns, makes a lot of hot gas which rushes down the barrel of the motor, gets to the throat where we squeeze it down real tight and then expand it out a nozzle. That's what gives you the thrust. So the motor's meant to take this hot gas and, and channel it down the, the throat, but every once in a while there's some air gaps where these segments come together and we have inhibitors so that they don't burn when they're not supposed to because the total amount of surface area burning is what generates the amount of gas which sets the thrust that you get out of the engine. So, so that's your the, the mo motor basics 101. So way down in the, in the, in the gap, there, there's some hot gas that sits there, but it doesn't really flow. It just kind of sits stagnant. And what we noticed was there was some, some localized charring that really only could happen if propellant was burning near there. And, and in what might be a red herring, but might not be, we saw video from when they were putting this inhibitor on the, s the face of that segment so that it won't burn. They noticed an air bubble that normally happens, and then they go backfill and, and take that bubble out. And it, it's hard to tell from the video, but it looks like they might not have quite got it just right on this motor. And this was, again, one of our static test motors where this casting occurred. Now, that doesn't prove that that's what happened, but it, it matches almost exactly with the scenario we see. So it's a really good indicator. But the team did all the right things and say, we're not going to be misled by that. We're going to go do a bounding analysis. And let's go take that liner where we had this little bit of erosion uh, completely out. Assume that we've failed to put it in altogether, and let's run the motor through a simulation and see what happens. And what we find is you get a little bit of extra heating because the insulator is not there as thick as it should be. It does cause some propellant to burn on the back side of the, uh, of the, of the casing, 
uh, a little bit, not down the main bore, but down on the backside, generates a little extra heat, but within about seven seconds, the main motor burns down to a level where that exposes that area, and it effectively quenches itself, if that makes sense. The, the, the propellant now goes rather through this little gap, now back down the main bore and out the nozzle. So you get about, at about 90 seconds, about a seven-second extra little burp as this propellant burns, and it takes about 90 seconds until it can get hot enough to actually ignite, and, and like I said, it only lasts about seven seconds before the rest of the motor has burned down to the point where you've uncovered that area. A lot of detail for you guys there, but basically what I'm trying to show is the team does an amazing amount of job, and, and our knowledge in the, in the realm of, of how large solid rocket motors perform is fantastic, thanks to the, uh, the, the expertise that we get out of the Marshall Space Flight Center uh, and the ATK folks out in Utah. They, they really know how these motors work, uh, and they're able to very accurately model and show us that this is not an area of concern. Uh, our process controls are such that we've never seen this happen before. We probably won't see it. Um, but we will catch it in a post-flight inspection, just like we did on this test motor, and rapidly be able to figure out that even in a worst-case analysis, and when we took that to worst case, we, we put some very, very conservative assumptions in there. We assumed the propellant would ignite about 200 degrees earlier than it normally would ignite. We, we removed the liner completely as opposed to putting a small air bubble in, uh, and, and they just layered up conservatism, conservatism over conservatism. And even when we did all that, we showed that we'd get about an extra 90 square inches of propellant burning for about seven seconds, and that causes us no problem whatsoever. Uh, from a ballistic standpoint, everything's good. Structurally, everything is good. And thermally, the casing and the case joint still maintains a factor of safety greater than, than even, I think it's greater than 2.6, which is well above our required safety factor. So even in that, that worst case bound, we're still well above our, our margins. So a lot of detail for you get there, guys, but that's kind of what we talked about today was, was that issue and how we know we're good to fly. The other issue was also in the in the booster world, and it was on a APU, which is an auxiliary power unit. When they're in the uh, in the orbiter, we call them APUs. When they're in the, the the boosters, we call them HPUs, hydraulic power units. But it's the same basic design. It's a it's a a, a big chunk of metal that burns hydrazine. We take hydrazine and decompose it, makes a hot gas. Spin that gas around a turbine. That turbine then drives a pump, which drives your hydraulics, which then moves your control surfaces. In the case of the booster, it's the thrust vector control that turns the nozzle and, and allows the SRB to point. Um, there's a speed sensor in that APU. The, the, the APU burns, it's kind of a pulse mode. Is you, you inject some fuel, it burns, and you let the turbine get to the right speed. When the turbine starts to spin down, you shoot a little more fuel in, and so it kind of pulses itself. If you've ever seen a shuttle night landing or the thermal imaging, you see that pulse coming up off the tail. That's the exhaust from an APU in the shuttle, and you see it kind of comes in that pulse. Well, the SRBs do the same thing. They pulse to operate. So there's speed sensors in there, and you want those speed sensors to work because that tells you how much fuel to inject. Uh, on the motor that they're preparing for, for DM2, we call it DM2, which is a demonstration motor number two. This is in support of the Ares, Ares 1 Constellation program. That hot fire is, again, a static motor firing uh, that's going to happen out in Utah. It's coming up in a couple months. They were pre prepping the APU that's going into that boost, and in preparation for that, they did a hot fire of it. And in that hot fire test, they noticed that one of the speed sensors on this APU was behaving erratically. So they tore it all apart, sent it back to the vendor, did some non-destructive analysis, and then did a whole lot of destructive analysis on this speed sensor to find out what the problem is. And basically, it's, it's the same failure mode that we know we are exposed to right now, which is the wiring in that magnetic coil can crack. And if you break, this, break the, the wire, you lose your, your continuity, and obviously you lose the signal coming out of that speed sensor. So there was no new failure mode there, so we don't have anything to worry about. Uh, it's kind of a random thing. Uh, it's not really a lifetime-driven issue. Uh, but, uh, but what we did was we reviewed all the build paperwork on the, the parts we have out on the fleet, out the pad right now, uh, and everything looks really good there. And, and really what we have is, is it's a failure mode we know, and we control that with testing and screening. So these APUs that we're about to fly have been screened. They've been hot-fired. They've been spin-tested. Uh, we did a bite check, which basically tests the continuity of that circuit last night. We'll do another one again at T minus nine hours. And then ultimately, when we ignite that APU at ignition, getting ready to spin it up to be prepared to light off the solid rocket motor, uh, if that APU sensor failed, the LCC would kick in and, and, uh, and shut that down, and we would, not, uh, we would not go forward in the counts. That would be an abort. So we're protected if this failure occurs before flight. We've screened for it, and if it does happen, we're okay. Once we get in, in flight, uh, there's two of them, and if one fails, the other one works just fine as a backup. So we have redundancy in the system. So, again, both those issues didn't get a lot of press time in the, uh, in the, in the course of coming through the program's channels just because they were both late notice items. So we spent a little extra time at the meeting today to go over them. Uh, the charts had a lot more details and facts and figures than they normally do, so, so that just took us a little longer today to flip through the charts. But at the end of the day, 
both the recommendations from the teams presenting and the, the, the recommendation from the, the panel and the MMT was that those both were perfectly good for flight, no issues whatsoever, and we're good to go. Um, finished up a couple other cats and dogs, but again, to wrap it all up, at the end of the day, uh, a unanimous poll from the MMT that we're go to launch. Uh, and so with that, we, we turn Pete loose to finish his countdown and, and get us ready to go. Um, from a, from a mission standpoint, you guys heard yesterday a fair bit about the uh, the science that's going on this mission, and I just wanted to take a, another moment to emphasize that. The MPLM we're carrying has um, about 16 racks in it. Uh, about 11 of them are resupply, but, but we're taking up four utilization racks that are taking up some really good new science, an exercise research center, uh, an express rack for payloads, um, a new freezer for science, and, a, uh, and, and, and what's called WARF, which is effectively the dark room that they'll put over the window uh, to really enhance the quality of the pictures they're able to take uh, from the ISS through the lab window. So some really good science going up in the MPLM. And on the mid-deck, we're taking up 12 separate experiments on the mid-deck. This is one of the, the, the most heavily science-loaded mid-decks that we've had in a very long time. Uh, and there's a lot of good science going up on the mid-deck. Um, and so I know Joe was here yesterday talking to you about all those details. I won't regurgitate them all. But, but again, we're really excited about this mission, both in terms of what it's going to do to position the, the ISS for extension through 2020 and the science that we're able to get on board uh, for the ISS to go do what it needs to do and, and, and demonstrate its true ability as a national laboratory. So with that, I'll stop talking, and I'll let Pete talk to you about the countdown. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, well, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, uh, STS-131 launch countdown is in progress, and it's, it's in great shape. Uh, this morning, uh, we completed the fuel cell cryogenic load on schedule. Uh, the pad's been reopened, and we're proceeding with our uh, closeouts uh, on track for uh, uh, tanking uh, tomorrow evening. We're also picking up today with uh, some offload of that fuel cell liquid oxygen system uh, propellant about 615 pounds for weight and center of gravity uh, savings for ascent performance. Um, let's see for uh, what milestone look aheads uh, as we proceed through closeouts uh, this evening. Uh, we plan to uh, activate the uh, ground and, and flight communication systems tomorrow, early tomorrow morning at about 3.30 a.m. Retract the uh, rotating service structure at 0930, uh, then pick up with uh, external tank uh, cryogenic load at about uh, um, 9 o'clock tomorrow evening and still on track for launch at uh, Monday morning at the preferred launch time of 6.21 a.m. Uh, the only uh, non-standard work item uh, that uh, we're working on the launch countdown that uh, Mike did not mention was uh, we have some folks uh, currently in work with uh, performing some uh, torque checks on uh, fasteners on our orbiter window number three, which has a Vespel type fastener. It's the only window on the um, the discovery vehicle that has that type of fastener. And we're just performing some torque checks as a, as a, just an additional uh, confidence uh, measuring uh, measure to just verify that they're within the appropriate limits. As we did notice that there were a few uh, fasteners on um, Atlantis the other evening that we noticed it had had some relaxation on its uh, torque value. Uh, we're, sent, we're working that, uh, performing that work today and should wrap up uh, by late tonight so that there will, we fully expect no impact at all with uh, our normal launch countdown timelines. So in, in, in essence, countdown's in great shape and we're not tracking any issues. Uh, let's see, although we fully expect to launch Monday morning and the weather you'll hear from Kathy here momentarily is uh, looking really good, our scrub turnaround uh, posture is such that we could try two shuttle launch attempts both Monday and then Tuesday, and then if we do not get off the ground by Tuesday, we'll stand down for three days uh, so as to deconflict with another range um, uh, conflict later in the month with an Atlas launch, uh, which affects, uh, would affect our uh, shuttle launch, our shuttle landing, I'm sorry. Uh, so then we would stand down for those three days, to have two more uh, launch attempts, and then we'd get uh, in into uh, croaching uh, uh, the uh, end of the window before the beta, beta angle cutout takes effect on the, four, on the 15th of April. In essence, though, overall, uh, the countdown's in great shape. Uh, this team is doing what we do best, which is uh, preparing the vehicle for launch and a, and a great mission, and we're on track and ready to go for Monday. Thank you. Kathy. Um, weather does look good for Monday. The only concern we have on Monday is for a chance for some fog. We've had fog in the area the last couple of days. This morning, though, it did not happen nearly as much, uh, just down to five nautical mile visibility, which is um, a go 
a, a go visibility for us uh, for RTLS, return to launch site landing. So right now it does look like uh, things are starting to improve. And the reason why that's happening is the winds are shifting around from the east more. So instead of having um, winds from the west, which causes us to get colder temperatures and drop down to saturation, when the winds turn around from the east, we moderate out more and our temperatures don't drop quite as cold all the way down to that dew point temperature. And so we have less chance for fog. So right now we're going with a, just a 20% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch due to that concern for fog limiting visibility. Spaceflight Meteorology Group is forecasting also good weather at the Tau sites. Um, Istris is a little bit windy and right up against the headwind constraint, but uh, both uh, Zaragoza and also Marone are, are go, and actually Istris is forecast is within constraints as well, so looking very good for Tau. And also uh, they're forecasting good weather all three days. For us here at KSC, our, the, for um, Tuesday, if we happen to delay, the weather still continues to look very similar. So again, we have a 20% chance on that day of KSC weather prohibiting launch. If we happen to go to Wednesday, the weather's not looking too bad on that day either. Uh, we're just a little bit more concerned about a ceiling on that day. So with that, we have a 30% chance of KSC weather prohibiting launch. So overall, the weather does look very good with that 20% chance on, on launch day. And also after this, the uh, vehicle launches, we should get a nice sunrise right along the plume after, uh, after the launch as well. So it should be a really beautiful morning. For launch. And I think there's actually, there's an ISS pass that goes overhead at about 20 minutes before our launch, so the ISS you'll see going over the horizon right. just, just before we launch. Thank you. We'll now take questions. When the microphone comes your way, please state your name, your affiliation, and to whom you're addressing your question. Chris. Um, Chris Gebert with NASASpaceFlight.com uh, with one for Pete uh, regarding the end of the window. Uh, when exactly does the beta angle cutout begin and, and what's your last day to, to launch in, in April? The, the Beta angle kicks in on the 15th of April, so we have the f we do have the 14th available to us, and then the beta angle takes uh, that cutout takes place through the 29th. So our first attempt on that, the next opportunity after would be April 30th. And then just standard caveat to that, right? That that's all driven by that's the launch date to go fly the mission as planned. Before we hit the beta, we can always change the duration of the mission to adjust that. So if we found ourselves at the back of the window, we might want to wiggle that a little bit. And, and you guys have seen us do that before. Mark. Hi, Mark Kirkman, Interspace News. Uh, just a quick one for Mike. Uh, for the TAL sites on the first attempt, are we down one or two? I thought there was like, the, you got the King of Spain issue, and I thought there was a notum for the other one. Am I right on that? No, for, uh, for the fifth, we have all three TAL sites up and available to us, and you heard the weather's good. Um, I think it's on the 12th that Marone goes down because they're going to do some runway work. Um, and then there's a, a notum, I think, on the 6th for, uh, for Zaragoza, just for a single day. But, but for launch day, all three up, ready to go. James. James Dean from Florida today. F Mike and Pete, um, President's going to be visiting the area late in, later on in, in this mission. Um, if you had a chance to talk to him about the program and what direction you'd like to, to see it go in the coming months and years maybe, uh, what would you tell him? Uh, let's see, I'm going to go to Houston, so I won't be here. So that's, I think, I'll, I'll duck the question, right? No, uh, you know, the, the the thing is, you know, you can look at the program. We talked a little bit this morning about that at the at the mission. I had gone to see uh, the Hubble movie, the Hubble 3D movie over at the IMAX at the view at the visitor center, uh, and it was a really great reflection on on the Hubble mission. And, and it, it didn't hit me until I left it. This, this is the 20th anniversary of the launch of that mission, which which uh, which kind of puts it in perspective. 29 years ago, coming up here in the in the closer to the end of April, we'll have the anniversary of the first shuttle launch. And so from a history perspective, this has been a, a fantastic program with a whole lot of history to it. In the last little bit here, it's been mostly focused on space station uh, and, and getting the station up and ready as a science laboratory and as a test bed for demonstration for hardware that we need for exploration. Um, and so from a mission standpoint, um, the NASA mission is, as how it progresses and advances science and technology throughout the country and throughout, uh, throughout the world for that matter. This is also the 50th anniversary of the launch of a first weather satellite. And if you just, that alone can kind of put into perspective for most people that, that what they get from a weather forecasting system these days as opposed to, to what we would have if we didn't have all, all this technology up in orbit uh, kind of really lets you see what, what hits you right away. So, so the shuttle program fits right into that same story. Um, I wouldn't try to, to dictate policy to him at all, but I think he understands the importance uh, of, of a mission and, a, and a, uh, uh, of, of a of a focus to have inspiration throughout both the uh, the education system and the and the science and technology community. I think he definitely recognizes that. We see that in his budget increases uh, and his support for NASA. So, I, I, I would I would not go too much further than that, though. Well, and I agree with Mike as well. Uh, 
I think uh, many of us who are close to uh, the shuttle program and it throughout, in fact, all of NASA uh, are really, a, we really have a zeal for and a passion for, for doing this kind of work and having this uh, just being a part of very, something very special in not, not only human space flight but also exploration and we fully expect to, to be engaged in some capacity in that same way even after the shuttle program ends. Jay. Jay Barbary with NBC. Uh, can't see you there, Mike. <laughs> You're talking about ISS coming over about 20 minutes before launch. Will it be coming out of the southwest? Do you know the azimuth going across? Will it be almost directly overhead? Or uh, I don't actually. I didn't write down the details. I know that the PAO folks have them, so Kendra can get you that. Information. Okay, I, I'll get that. And another thing that I've been wondering about and writing about. Maybe you can help me with it. Uh, the other day before a congressional committee, the president of uh, SpaceX said that they guaranteed they would be able to launch astronauts on board Dragon within three years. And if they do, they're getting ready, as you know, for their first launch of Falcon 9 here. If they do, that could very well be the next time that we launched, uh, Americans launched from uh, Cape Canaveral astronauts into space. And I was just wondering, what happens? Does mission control come back up and NASA takes over the flight of Dragon for the docking with the space station? Or, or is NASA involved here? Or is that something like uh, Delta Airlines taking up, <laughs> uh, you know, three or four or five or six astronauts to the space station? How does that work? Let's see. None of those details have been worked out. That's all work in front of us to figure out how that model works. Right now, the contracts with, with Falcon 9 or with, with SpaceX uh, and with Orbital, for that matter, are for cargo delivery to the station. And, and from that standpoint, um, the NASA insight is there in terms of how they're designing their hardware, how they're planning their mission, but, uh, but then it becomes the, the, the rendezvous and control stuff. So the these space station team and mission control back in Houston and, and station mission control would execute the, uh, the, the reach out, grapple it with the arm, and, and plug it in, dock it to the station, and obviously the crew would unpack that cargo. From a crude standpoint, there's a lot of folks out working on the plan, but there isn't a plan and nothing's been actually agreed to or contracted with, uh, with SpaceX. So, so that's all future work to define how that would work. The scenario you laid out is a possibility. Um, actually, all the scenarios you laid out were possibilities. You could go from a, a fully NASA-controlled mission to a, a completely uh, commercial-provided mission where you just are a taxi service, and, and the realm of that is, is, is free and open. Thank you, Mike. I've asked questions all over the place about this and can get no answers. That was very clear. You Thank you. Answer, so. <laughs> I know. It's well, say so. Say <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Jay, we will get you information on the ISS, but as part of our launch commentary, we'll attempt to show it live Monday morning. Uh, Tarek. Thank you, uh, Tarek Malik with Space.com and Space News for Mike. You mentioned kind of a, the, the significant events and history uh, that are going on this month, and this is the the fourth to last shuttle flight. It's the second to last flight for Discovery. And I'm just uh, wondering what the, the thoughts are of your team, maybe Pete, for you too, uh, knowing that after this, everything is the last the last uh, event for each of the shuttles and, um, and each of the, the milestones. Let's see, you know, it, it's hard to speak for the workforce since it's such a large workforce. Um, and so we try to generalize and, and, and at times I feel good about that because the generalizations we make are about how dedicated and unbelievably loyal they are to the job they do, but that kind of then dehumanizes their individual concerns. And 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 as a as a as a as a somebody out here working who has a job and a family and and, and worrying about how they're paying the bills and sending their kids to college, um, um, it would hit me every single day that that there's only a few more left. And as we hit the lasts, it would it would sink home even further. But but we step away from that. And as as a as a leadership team, you look at the end product of that workforce, and what you get out is is that loyalty, that dedication, that unbelievable commitment to the mission at hand, um, and, and just the act of going out at the last minute to, to check the torque fasteners on these uh, on these windows is a great example of of, of the can-do attitude. You know, the, the briefing wasn't well. This is hard, and this is going to be tough, and this is going to be. It's going to make us work extra hours. It was, yep, we can do that. If that's what we need to do, we will do it, and we'll do it safe and on time. And so, so, so I, again, I like to tell you that message. We tell it to you all the time, but, but I don't want to take away from the fact that this is a very human uh, space program, not just with the humans flying in the shuttle, but the folks building it, preparing it, and, uh, and getting ready to launch it. Personally, um, 
when I get into this time frame and we get into the, the week or two before launch, everything completely changes, and I'm no longer thinking about the lasts and the, and the ends. I'm thinking about the, the, the excitement and the buildup and the anticipation for the launch coming up, and I think that reflects in the team as well. I don't think there's too many people out there right now at their desks worried that we're about to end. They're all looking forward to, to Monday morning and a launch, and so you ask that question on Tuesday, we might get a little different answer, but right now I think spirits are very high, uh, geared up towards that, that launch event that we're about to have. Well, and, and I agree with Mike completely in every aspect of his comments. Um, you know, one of the things uh, that many members of our management team are very concerned about is just wanting to make sure that, that, that the, the health, and health and the vibrancy of the workforce and also how it relates to our ability to get the job done. And, and I can tell you without um, any reservation that the, we are making this launch countdown work without any issues. Everything has been fine. Everything is looking great. And, uh, and certainly there is a lot of that excitement as we lo as we lead up to uh, certainly this launch, and then as we get as we get later on closer to the end of the program, we're certainly going to have to talk that and have it certainly in front of us on a daily basis. Marsha, <coughs> Marsha Dunn, Associated Press for Pete on the launch attempts. Mm -hmm. um, so if you try Monday and Tuesday, then you'd come back on Friday or Saturday. I think. Oh. We would try Friday and then okay. also Saturday, and then we would stand down 48 hours and try again on the 12th. And so if you're not up Monday because of a technicality and you can't go Tuesday, can you try Wednesday or that's absolutely no bite? If we were to try, we could try on Monday, and if for some technical issue we're to need to stand down, we could, by virtue of a previous arrangement now that we've made with Atlas, we could try on Wednesday. You could. We could do a 48-hour scrub, try Wednesday, okay. and if that were to be the case, then we would then stand down for 72 hours after the Wednesday attempt. Okay, thank you. And for Mike, um, yesterday we were told that you're going to try for a flight day rendezvous if necessary every single day. Um, is that still the case, and will that just nix out your one extra day, and so be it uh, that you have up your sleeves just in case? Yeah, so uh, uh, we usually carry a plus one day to, to allow us to have an extra day for whatever the, the reason is. One of the, the big things that can cause that is if we, we find ourselves in a launch scenario or, or even once we get in orbit, that we need an extra day, and we, we rendezvous on flight day number four instead of flight day number three, which is the standard plan. And, and what typically happens with the, uh, the phase angles and the, and the orbits between us and space station is we'll find ourselves in a repeating pattern where you'll have a day where, where you have the entire 10-minute window is, is a, a plane that lets you get to a flight day three rendezvous. And then you'll have some days where you don't quite have that whole pane of flight day three to get the 10 minutes. Some of that at the end of the window would mean you'd be docking on flight day four. And that's all driven by the orbital mechanics, the time it takes you to make up the orbit. Um, to allow us to have that many opportunities, we're taking some assumptions in the, in the orbital mechanics, or actually should say the, uh, the ability of the shuttle once it's in orbit to steer itself where it needs to go. And some of that just means we don't have enough time and, and it takes us to flight day four to get there. Um, we typically don't usually have that on the first day, although there's nothing that says, it's not that we planned it that way. It's really where the station altitude finally ends up compared to our launch day. We usually tweak it just a little bit right before with a, a, an ISS reboost to set it up to be exactly what we want. This one happened to work out without a need for a reboost. It's just that we had our flight day four windows starting on flight day, our first launch attempt as opposed to the second, which is kind of more typical. So we usually don't talk to you guys about that because it's usually in a scrub scenario. Um, and, and so today we talked about it, or today, uh, for this mission rather, we talked about it from a, do we want to use that? And again, what you're trading is if, you, if, you, if you're going to use it to get off the ground, you now don't have it when you get in orbit. So we looked at this mission and we've actually, by going to a descending landing opportunity, we've added about 27 hours to the cruise day. So even though it's a 13-day mission, from what it was with an ascending landing to the new landing time for descending, we've effectively added up the equivalent of a crew day in there. It's about an hour each day, so it's not a new day that we carved out, but we let them work an hour later each day. Instead of sleep shifting early every day, they're now sleep shifting later every day, and as you guys all know, that's much easier to do than to try to go to bed a half an hour early every single day for two weeks. Um, at some point, you, you, you break it, and, and now you're all messed up. So from a crew productivity standpoint, it's a much better plan. Um, that allowed us to fill in not only the planned mission activities, but all the things on the wish list. So there's nothing in the station program right now which says, hey, we are carrying this threat that we're going to want you to stick around and use that one extra day. So we've kind of cleaned that off. And so given that, we said, you know, today, really, we can go free and clear and just move right into that flight day four opportunity. If we need it, that's our plus one day, and, and no, no, no harm, no foul. So, so we're going to go ahead and try that if we need to. Um, the only go back on what Pete said, again, in black and white terms, I just don't want you guys to take away. We talk about what days we can launch, what days we can't, what agreements we made with the range. 
nothing's actually set and fast until we actually don't launch and then we talk about what we're going to do next so so sometimes I get in trouble with the uh, with the ULA guys because they, they read about in the press that I've made some deal with them that I actually haven't made. Um, and so we have a negotiation open, and we understand each other's constraints, and, and, and there's good good agreement between the two programs to, to do what we need to. I am a third row, please. Jay Klodek, Nebraska Press Association. This question is for, Ka uh, for Kathy. Um, okay, you talked about how at the time of day that the shuttle launch will probably get some sunlight on the stack high in ascent. Do you have a prediction as to what altitude that will be at, or do we not have enough data yet? Secondly, what will the sky conditions look like at about launch time before, um, before sunrise? I don't have the data on the first question. There may be someone uh, on the flight side that has that information, um, so I'll pass that on to you, Kandria. Okay. <laughs> but um, for the sky conditions, uh, the, so long as there's no fog and we launch, we're expecting almost clear skies. We just went with one-eighth coverage of clouds, so it's going to be beautiful in that way. My question is for, uh, for Mike, um, so let me get this straight. Descending node uh, reentry and landing, that is on the cards, on the table? Okay. Yeah, we've planned that. This mission has a planned descending landing opportunity. Okay, over the continental United States, first one since STS-120, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Okay, um, first row here, please. Andrew Rennie from Southern FM in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, a question to Pete. Uh, after y the launch and you look out the window at the empty pad, uh, what thoughts are going through your mind as you look you know, there at the pad and it's gone and your job's done? Well, um, actually there's a few thoughts that, uh, that come to my mind. From the, from the control room, uh, we have a convoy of folks that do access the pad and, we, and it's important for us to safe that pad properly. So it, it, there's one thing in seeing joy in, in uh, and, and watching the vehicle as it ascends and, and attains its proper or, uh, orbit. And certainly we're watching the vehicle's performance during ascent to make sure that the vehicle's in great shape. But right after that, we have that team of folks that enters into the pad to safe, uh, securing a, a bunch of the uh, commodities and uh, systems such that we can get ready to prepare the, turn, the, the pad for the next launch. And in this case, the STS-132 vehicle will be following right on the heels of STS-131. So. So we'll be uh, quite busy right after, uh, right after launch, even uh, getting that pad turned around ready to go. See, if you don't mind me jumping in, I'm, I'm sitting here chuckling to myself because it's a really cool dynamic, if you guys can see it. Every person has a job, and, and it really colors what their view of the world is. So um, we sit there, and, and, and we launch, and then in two, two minutes, the boosters fall away, and the SRB team all relaxes and starts, you know, oh, okay, we're done, and like, hey, we're still going. And then, and then we get to Miko, and the main engine team goes, Phew, okay, they were, and no, we're, we're still going. We've got to get to Ohms 2 to get into a safe orbit. We're, we're not coming back around. So as you peel off each of the teams, the same thing when we get to finally hit Miko, the, the control center starts to relax, but Pete's team is still running on all four cylinders <laughs> to get out there to get the pad safe and cleared. So you've seen in the past we can sometimes start brush fires, and they've got to go out there and take care of that. So it's, you know, but it's just weird to see the little bubbles of dynamics and, and different consoles start talking and relax a little bit. But, but the overall picture still that it's very much a, a lot of work to do even after we get into orbit. Absolutely. It's fun. <laughs> Ken. Hi, thank you. Ken Kramer for um, Planetary Society and Space Flight Magazine. Mike, I'd like to follow up on what you discussed at the beginning, the very extensive work you do to keep the shuttle safe and other comments you made at the uh, STS-130 landing where you feel that basically that the shuttle has been recertified, this issue where, where the Augustine Commission feels it would need to be recertified and that therefore you could not extend the shuttle because it hasn't been uh, recertified. But it, many of you in NASA seem to feel that it, it has been recertified. So I, could you amplify your comments and reiterate your comments a little bit on exactly what your position is on the safety of the shuttle and how long it would be uh, you could fly the shuttle safely. How many years? Well, let's see. Yeah, it's a good chance. Let me clarify some of the, the comments. From a, from a paperwork standpoint, we have not recertified the shuttle. So, uh, but what happened is after, uh, after the CABE report came out, it listed a, a, a host of areas that would need to be addressed and attacked to, to look at a long-term extension uh, if you're going to continue to fly the shuttle. And so we started as a program to go burn down those lists of, of the long lead items that we knew we needed testing, we knew we needed to put some money into. And so after Columbia and the CABE report, we started down the path of getting the shuttle uh, extension effectively 
uh, underway, even though we weren't officially kicking off an extension effort. Um, so w as the budgets changed and the direction and the policy changed to say, well, we're not actually going to fly shuttle through 2020 and look at a 10-year extension. We're going to go into 2010 and look there. The effort to to close the paper, sign the forms, and get everybody to officially call it certified beyond 2010 went away. So we stopped the, the effort to do that. But at the same time, a lot of the work that was laid out by the CAVE was work that's needed to support safe flight again and again. So all the tank redesigns, all the foam testing we did, all the learning processes that we put in place after Columbia, we, we still to this day continue to do and, and will right up until the very last missions we'll stop. And so all that builds to the data you need to be able to then pull the piece of paper off the shelf and sign it and say it's now certified for another 10 years. So from that standpoint, we're not certified to fly, but we've gotten the bulk of the work done. And if we needed to, you could go in and, and, and probably without a lot of effort um, and, and, uh, and time and money, get that done. That's not to say it's, it's cheap and free and easy, but we've gotten the big stuff taken care of. And again, that doesn't mean that, that, that everything is fine. We, we haven't had that program level review. We haven't had the independent teams come in and say, yep, yay, verily, you can now certify yourself. In our world, the word certify means a, a whole heck of a lot. Uh, and so we don't use it too lightly. So we, we don't talk about in the program that we've certified the shuttle. We talk about we have the work we need to be able to continue to fly the shuttle. Um, the next question in terms of, of the safety of the shuttle and, and my, my opinion there, what I can tell you is, is I don't think you'll find a, uh, anybody in the program, and I would hope uh, that, that the folks who do our independent reviews, if they took a look at everything we've done since Columbia, you couldn't say that, that we are in the safest configuration that we've been since the beginning of the shuttle program. We now have more tools, techniques, and analysis behind us to know exactly what we're doing. There is always the unknown unknown, and, and that is the fear. If you look back, you know, we do a great job of never having the same accident again, but that that's not the real challenge, right? The challenge is to not have the accident you don't know is coming. And how do we, how are our processes and our, and our tools and our hardware helping us get down that path? So that the safety of flying the shuttle out kind of goes to two things. There's the, the actual hardware safety. It, it's in great shape. If you go take a look at it, it does not look like it was built 30 years ago. It's been taken care of in a controlled environment. It's basically sat, other than sitting out the launch pad a couple weeks every time, uh, it's in an air-conditioned environment that would make any aircraft engineer who works on military aircraft jealous of the condition we're able to keep our hardware. Um, so from that standpoint, the airframe, the, 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 the electrical wiring, all that stuff's in fantastic shape and could keep flying, I, I have no doubt, without any problems. There's a lot of lifetime issues. We have a lot of old legacy equipment. We don't have a lot of supplier base. So the act of continuing to fly has some programmatic challenges to it, uh, which drive a lot of costs and make us a, a very expensive program to keep around. And then you hit the management structure. And so that's where I think you hear most of the comments coming from the shuttle team is as a management team, as a process, we are in the best possible place that we've ever been. And so we are all highly confident that there is no difference between asking us to fly one more mission and asking us to fly 10 more. We would be as safe on all of those. Now, the number that that is, that's a political budget question, not a shuttle technical or safety question, I believe. So I think when you hear people comment, you're getting the lines crossed between what's the actual technical capability to extend and what's the, the policy and the budget need to extend. We certainly can do it. Do we want to? Do we want to pay to do it? That's the, that's the decision being made uh, above us to tell us what we need to do, and then we go implement it. So, so I can't give you a number to say how long we could go, how long. Uh, what I will tell you is based on the, what we do right now, assuming we operate the way we're operating, every single one that we fly, including these next four, will be as safe as, uh, if not safer than the ones before them. Does that make sense? That's beautiful. <laughs> so you, you would fly on the shuttle, all of you? Um, yeah, I know that's a tough one, right? Because I, I used to always want to be an astronaut, but I, I think I have more fun doing what I'm doing now. So, no, I'd fly. <laughs> but I think I'd fly too. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Chris. Um, Chris Gebhardt with NASA Spaceflight.com again. Uh, Mike, you mentioned something a, a few minutes ago, and uh, John Shannon and uh, Bill Gerstemeyer mentioned it in the uh, post FRR as well. Um, a descending node entry is easier sleep shifting for the crew, buys you more time on orbit. So why aren't, our, why aren't all missions planned to be descending node missions? Because if I'm remembering correctly, 131 was originally planned as an ascending node, and it was just switched about a month and a half ago. So why aren't all descending nodes? Let's see, I'll, I'll switch back to, to flight director mode and, and talk about how we do flight design and mission planning. Um, when a mission is baselined, it's, it's usually from a, from a mission plan and, and setting the hardware and the payloads, that's about two and a half years out. 
and then it rolls in and about a year out the, the mission planning team gets a hold of it and lays out all the hardware all the activities all the all the spacewalks that have to happen and builds a timeline that says on these days we need to do these activities and you you usually immediately run into a conflict in the, just the amount of time in each day uh, to do an EVA that takes the entire day there's usually robotic relocations that happen between EVAs and you just have a crew workload so you build yourself a plan and it's a very delicate balanced plan that mission timeline is uh, it takes a lot of care and feeding to get one that works that has a lot of redundancy can handle a lot of failures uh, you've seen the teams these last couple missions build ex outstanding ones because we do have those speed bumps but yet we don't have massive replans in the mission so you get one of those ready to go descending opportunities only work on given calendar years uh, days of the calendar um, there's a there's a, a an issue with a thing called noctilucent clouds which are extremely high altitude ice clouds um, and we don't want to fly through them. We don't have very good tools to find them or predict where they're going to be or to be able to avoid them, so we just do not come over the continental United States in the summer months when those clouds have a chance to be there. So if you build yourself this nice, beautiful timeline that has the crew sleep shifting later each day, and your launch gets slipped four months right before launch, and now you find yourself in the summer, you have to completely rebuild your mission, throw it all out, and start over again to build a descending timeline, or I'm sorry, an ascending timeline that allows you to now not do that, and you sleep shift the other way, and it, they just don't work very well together. So what we see is it's easier to build yourself the generic one, which is the ascending, and that covers you for all bases, and then case by case, if you find yourself guaranteed in the summer, you can switch. Sometimes the training that the crew's gone through says, even if you could do it, we're still not going to switch. One of my last missions, uh, STS-123, was that way. We would have liked to have switched, but it was so late in the training plan, it would have added some variables that we didn't want to take, so we just stayed where we were. Um, uh, but if you can, we'd like to switch, but, but from that standpoint, so it's more of an inertia of the build a plan that works no matter what, uh, that kind of keeps you away from the descending landing opportunities. James? James, Dean Floyd today. Mike, um, one of the last, we think, is uh, last crew is seven flying, I think, um, and, and I guess that would be the last um, time, last time for a while anyway, that uh, we'd see 13 on, on station. and. Um, anyway, just wondered if, if you could remind us why um, this mission needs the maximum shuttle crew and, and the rest of them don't. Yeah, and you're catching me. Uh, I haven't done my homework on that one to remember what the, the manifest is for the next couple crews. I know when we get towards the end, um, it becomes more of a trade of, of for, for, for weight going uphill. Um, it, it, the mission content is going to change. The, the last couple missions have less EVAs. In fact, I think our very last mission has no planned EVAs. Um, and so that means a whole lot less consumables that you need to take up. Uh, you could then even take crew members off, which means you don't have to take the associated weight for that crewman and then uh, and all the food and gear that goes with them. And then that lets you take more payload up to the station. And since the focus of these last several missions is, is preemptive resupply to, to position the station with all the, the big pieces that, that the shuttle is uniquely qualified to carry up, we want to try to get as much of that in orbit as we can. And, and given that the station assembly tasks are winding down, you can put some of that work into the stage rather than having it with the, sh the shuttle crew. So that's the generic philosophy that drives um, these last couple of missions are going to have a few less crewmen because we're going to tackle the problem a little differently on the last couple of flights than we have on previous flights. So that's the generic answer. Thank you. Marcia. Mar Marcia Dunn, Associated Press for Mike and or Pete. Tomorrow's Easter. And do you envision scaling back your workforce tomorrow morning because of that if someone wants off? Or, or is this going to be just like any other countdown tomorrow morning? How, how's that all being handled, please? Tomorrow's ac activities, um, even though it is Easter Sunday, is just like any other typical launch minus one day uh, countdown uh, timeline. All the, tip all the planned standard activities are just like they would be per, for, the na for that nominal timeline. We did ask our... Uh, our folks, our managers, to uh, to just check and work, check through their workforce to make sure that there weren't any issues or conflicts. There were not. Uh, folks are uh, very excited and ready to ready to work the work the timeline as necessary. In the front row, please. Andrew Rennie, Southern FM in Melbourne. Uh, to Kathy Winters, please. Uh, what weather can the folks gathered around uh, the KSC area expect overnight as they wait for this launch? Well, if you're a little bit more inland, you're going to see some patchy fog because the inland areas will likely be affected by some patchy areas of fog. Um, it'll be, um, temperatures will probably be in the inland areas a little more in the mid to upper 50s. And closer to the coast, you'll be in the low 60s. And so it'll be pretty comfortable compared to how it's been over the 
the winter t here in Florida. And uh, so as the launch occurs, there's really not going to be a lot of cloud cover out there, so you should be able to see it from a pretty far distance away, um, other than if you're sitting in a little bit of an inland area with some fog. But even so, I think you'll still have a good view of the launch. should be beautiful. Okay, we have time for one more question. No more questions? Well, that will conclude the STS-131 pre-launch news conference. Coming up next at 1.10 p.m. Eastern Time is an International Space Station Science and Technology Briefing. For more information on the STS-131 mission and crew, visit www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you. This is Shuttle Launch Control at T minus 5 hours, 52 minutes, 39 seconds and counting. The external tank for Space Shuttle Discovery's launch on the STS-131 mission has gone through processing to be ready for tonight's tanking, which will begin shortly. With me now is Tony Bartolome, the lead external tank solid rocket booster project engineer. Tony, thanks for joining me. Thanks very much for having me, Kendra. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the uh, the flow that it takes to get a tank ready. Um, I know that it takes about a month, so but you had a little bit of extra time on this one. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, normally, uh, ET processing takes about a month, and that's split between the checkout cell and the integration cell where, it, where it's made it to the SRBs. Uh, we did have a little extra time this uh, this flow because of the cold weather kept uh, Discovery from coming over to the VAB, so we had some uh, additional time to get ahead some more on some work and. Made the best time. I uh, made the best use of that time we could. Okay. And the tank arrived the day after Christmas. Yeah, that's correct. It came in on the 26th of December. Um, it stayed on the barge and then uh, was lifted into the checkout cell uh, just after the New Year. Okay, great. And we have a short video to uh, show if you could walk us through the uh, processing flow for an external tank. Great, I'd be happy to. Okay, uh, here you see T-135 arriving on the uh, barge Pegasus. It's being towed uh, in from the turn basin into the VAB. That process takes a couple of hours to bring the tank uh, into the transfer aisle of VAB. It's done by our uh, ET processing team here at KSC. You can see there the tank is towed back end first into the uh, the transfer aisle. Um, the uh, the covers that you see there on the nose cone are one of the items we remove once the tank is up in the checkout cell. There you can see it crossing the transom of the uh, VAB transfer aisle, and there it is in the transfer aisle. Once it's there, it's, uh, it stays there for um, up to a shift uh, while we uh, prepare to uh, make the, uh, the crane mate to it. And there's the crane mated to it and lifting it off of its transporter. The tank is uh, rotated uh, up vertically and uh, lifted up into its checkout cell. You can see it comes rather close to the floor, but it's a very controlled operation. You see ET-135 going up and over, and now it's being lowered into the checkout cell with all of our monitors there taking a look at everything, getting a good look at all the surfaces that for the first time. And this is ET-135's uh, trip to uh, KSC. You can see folks there um, uh, demating connectors, making sure everything is uh, uh, looking good. One of the first things we do is uh, shakedown and receiving inspection, making sure all the uh, uh, TPS surfaces, foam surfaces are uh, as we expect them, looking for any major defects, things that we might have to go work during the checkout cell processing. Um, there is the, the tank uh, being lifted and transferred over, I'm assuming, into the integration cell, where it will be made into the SRBs. It's BI-142 for this flight. It's lowered very gen uh, gently in between the SRBs, and we make the struts and uh, do all the final closeouts while we get ready for the orbiter to come over. It's a pretty short processing time, considering the amount of time it takes to build an external tank. Uh, we get the tank ready to um, meet the orbiter uh, in only about uh, 30 days. But like we said earlier, it's been a, a little longer for this flow because of the cold temperatures. Now, the external tank's the largest element of the space shuttle with the orbiter, space shuttle discovery, um, the solid rocket boosters, and also the external tank. How long is the tank? Uh, the tank is uh, 154 feet long. Um, it's uh, 
rather large considering that it's uh, uh, the main backbone of the, uh, the uh, space shuttle vehicle. And it weighs about a little over 58,000 pounds when it's empty, but when it's loaded, it's over a million and a half. Yeah, that's correct. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's quite a piece of engineering to consider that it's such a light, light um, a piece of spaceflight hardware. But then when we fill it with all the propellants, it's uh, incredibly heavy. And the external tank has three components to it. That's correct. The external tank has uh, is comprised of the uh, the LOX tank, which is at the very top of the uh, liquid oxygen tank, which is at the very top of the tank. The inner tank, which is the rib section that you see there, and then the hydrogen tank, which is the majority of the tank, which is the the bottom portion. Okay. And what does the inner tank do? The inner tank is really the main structural component of the external tank. Um, it carries the load from the SRBs uh, through the thrust beam that goes through the middle of the inner tank and uh, transfers the uh, the weight load from the uh, LOX tank the, and the LH2 tank so that um, the entire structure of the vehicle is rigid at those points. And the processing's not completely over once it's attached to the space shuttle. You still have to maintain the external tank throughout the flow until launch, is that right? Uh, that's absolutely correct, yeah. We do have uh, quite a bit of ET processing that takes place uh, after we've mated the orbiter to it, and then once we get to the pad to do all of the final connections and check out and make sure that everything's ready for launch. And what kind of things do you see? Are there foam repairs that need to be made? Yeah, quite often there are repairs. Um, we, uh, uh, it, the, the tank is rather gentle. Um, you know, we have to make sure we, we treat it with extreme care. The foam um, uh, does quite often get, uh, get damaged from external sources, such as birds, um, which we did have damage this time on ET-135 from some birds, actually, before we even left the VAB, and then a little bit more once we got out to the launch pad. Um, we, uh, we do do some processing damage to it. It's sometimes it's uh, an unav unavoidable. I mean, it's very tight tolerances that we're dealing with. Um, but all of those items are very easily addressed. We have an excellent processing team that knows how to um, handle those things, and we uh, quite frequently are, are uh, finding that they're, they're not a very significant issue at all. And those are things that you can do wherever the tank is, so if it's at the pad, you can do the repairs there? Well, access is a little more challenging at the pad to the external tank, but um, we have had uh, been fortunate enough to have uh, no issues with have had any uh, process problems with access. So. Well, Tony, thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining me here. Thank you, Kendra. I appreciate the opportunity. This is shuttle launch control at T minus three hours and holding with a little bit more than an hour remaining in this hold. Space Shuttle Discovery last flew STS-128 in September of 2009, landing back at Edwards Air Force Base in California. And after a cross-country ferry ride back here to Kennedy Space Center, Discovery has been under the watchful eyes of Stephanie Stilson getting ready for today's launch. Stephanie is Discovery's Flow Director, and we'd like to welcome you here with us this morning. Well, thank you, Mike. It's great to be here at this early morning hour. It is. We're looking forward to an awesome launch a little bit later on. You've been uh, Discovery's Flow Director for some time now. Yes, I actually joined the shuttle processing team in December of 2000, and this is actually my 10th mission that I've worked. I started out with SGS-102, so I'm on number 10 now. Excellent. And um, prior to becoming the uh, Flow Director, what roles did you have here at Kennedy Space Center? Well, within shuttle processing, I started out as Discovery's uh, NASA vehicle manager. And then in 2005, we reinstated the flow director role. And luckily, I was selected to be the flow director for Discovery as well. Prior to that, I worked International Space Station. I was a test director for the multi-element integration testing that we do here at Kennedy Space Center. Excellent. And um, at what point during a flow do you become responsible for the vehicle? My role really starts at the end of the mission. So as soon as we touch down, whether that be at Kennedy Space Center or at Dryden, wherever, um, that's when our processing flow starts. So that's where I begin. And really follow Discovery all the, all the way through the processing, also with the boosters in the tank, and all the way up to launch. And then get to take a little bit of a break and then get ready to start the next flow. And as we've been getting ready for STS-131, has this been a relatively clean flow? It has. It's been a relatively stable flow, especially compared to some of our previous flows in the, in the near past. Um, I really attest that to the great shape the vehicle is in, the great work the team has done here to really take very good care of Discovery. And I'm going to talk about a few of the off-nominal things that we did during the video clip, um, so we'll cover those then. Okay, so let's go ahead and roll the, ro the video. As Mike mentioned, Discovery landed at NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center in California after STS-128 and was ferried back to Kennedy Space Center in preparation for this current mission. The majority of the work is prepared orbit for flight occurring in the orbiter processing facility. Here we see technicians removing a gaseous nitrogen tank from the starboard side of the payload bay. As you can see, a crane is lifting the tank out of Discovery's midbody. 
This work was done for weight savings in preparation for Discovery's next mission, STS-133, slated for September. The orbiter's three space shuttle main engines are removed and replaced after each flight. Discovery's main engines were removed in early October and installed in early December of last year. Each engine is 14 feet long and 7.5 and feet wide and weighs approximately 7,000 pounds. Combined, the three main engines provide 375,000 pounds of thrust during liftoff. The yellow piece of equipment that you see here is a modified Heister forklift that we use to remove and install the main engines. Each engine is transported from the Space Shuttle main engine shop to the orbiter processing facility for installation. Installing the engines is a very slow and methodical process of ensuring everything is lined up correctly as the engines are inserted into the aft compartment. Technicians, engineers, safety and quality personnel closely monitor this critical task. The engines are ignited six seconds before liftoff when the fuel, liquid hydrogen, is combined with liquid oxygen. Here we see the removed forward reaction control system at the hypergolic maintenance facility at Kennedy Space Center. During Discovery's previous mission, a thruster in the forward reaction control system did not perform as expected. Therefore, it was necessary to change out that thruster prior to Discovery's next flight. Doing so required removing the forward reaction control system and transporting it to the hypergolic maintenance facility. Once all maintenance activities were completed, the forward reaction control system was carefully transported back to the orbiter processing facility for reinstallation. The yellow component that you see here is a holding fixture used to lift the forward reaction control system. Here we see the front portion of the orbiter where the forward reaction control system is located. And, um what does the forward reaction control system do, Stephanie? It actually works in conjunction with the orbiter maneuvering system in the back of the orbiter to generate thrust for velocity changes and attitude control on orbit and during reentry. Here you see a, t a technician performing a tile repair on the underside of the orbiter. There are approximately 24,000 tiles on the vehicle. Every tile is inspected following each mission and repaired or replaced as required. The day after Christmas, the external tank was delivered by barge to the Kennedy Space Center from the Mashu Assembly Facility in Louisiana. Once on dock, we used the external tank transporter to move the tank off the barge and over to the vehicle assembly building. While the entire offload process takes technicians and engineers approximately two hours, the actual travel time is only 10 minutes for the quarter mile trip. The tank is 154 feet long, 27 and a half feet in diameter, and holds over 500,000 gallons of propellant. The function of the external tank is to provide liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen to the three space shuttle main engines. The outside of the tank is covered in a polyurethane foam that protects it from extreme temperature variations. Once in the vehicle assembly building, we begin the slow and careful process of lifting the external tank into the vertical position and placing it in the checkout cell. The empty external tank weighs approximately 58,000 pounds and is lifted by massive overhead cranes in the vehicle assembly building. Stephanie, when the uh, tank is fully loaded, how much does it weigh? The external tank weighs uh, roughly 1.65 million pounds when fully loaded with liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Here you see the aft bipod struts and the propellant feed lines where the external tank connects to the orbiter's aft. Following standalone inspections and processing of the external tank, it's ready to be lifted out of the checkout cell and into the integration cell where it can be mated to the solid rocket boosters. Transport of this delicate flight hardware requires numerous support personnel to ensure careful and safe maneuvering. The forward tips of the solid rocket boosters can be seen here as the external tank is being lowered into position for mate. The tank is now in its final position, mated to the solid rocket boosters. Once all maintenance and checkout is complete in the orbiter processing facility, Discovery is carefully backed out and transported to the vehicle assembly building. While the distance from the orbiter processing facility to the vehicle assembly building is less than half a mile, the trip takes approximately 30 minutes. During the rollover for SJS-131, the crew made an unexpected visit and joined our team in escorting Discovery over to the vehicle assembly building. It was great to have the crew here for such an important processing milestone. Once safely in the vehicle assembly building, we begin the process of lifting the orbiter off the transporter and attaching it to the external tank. A yellow sling is connected to the orbiter so that cranes can lift Discovery and move it into the vertical position. Lifting the 200,000 pound orbiter requires use of a 325 ton crane and a 250 ton crane. Once Discovery is hanging in the vertical position, the smaller of the two cranes is disconnected and the larger crane lifts the orbiter up and over the transom into the integration cell. It takes approximately 12 hours to lift the orbiter and get it into the mate position. Technicians closely monitor the movement of the orbiter and are in radio contact with the crane operators at all times. Here you can see the space shuttle main engines with their red protective engine covers that are removed before flight. 
The completed space shuttle vehicle is, is moved by one of our two crawler transporters. Instead of wheels, the crawler has eight tracks with 57 cleats per track. Each cleat weighs one ton. The crawler weighs 6 million pounds and uses 150 gallons of diesel fuel per mile as it travels down a gravel path out to the launch pad. The crawler is 131 feet long by 114 feet wide, which is comparable in size to the infield of a regulation baseball field. The gravel crawler way is 130 feet wide, roughly the width of an eight-lane highway. At a speed of less than one mile per hour, it takes approximately eight hours to travel just over three miles building to pad A. Discovery was delivered to launch pad in the morning on March once at the launch pad, we spent about a month doing a full system checkout of the tank, boosters, and orbiter in preparation for launch. You know, one question a lot of people have is why does the uh, left-hand solid rocket booster have a thick black stripe at the top and the right-hand one does not? That was something I learned just recently myself. Um, the solid rocket boosters actually, once they're expended, uh, they're jettisoned from the external tank and fall into the Atlantic Ocean. We have two retrieval ships that recover the boosters and tow them back to the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. The unique stripe that you mentioned is on the left-hand booster, allowing the two retrieval ships to differentiate between the left and the right booster as they descend from the sky and eventually splash down in the ocean. The team that prepares Discovery for flight is the best that, that there is out there, and I'm very honored to work with each and every one of them. We are all looking forward to the successful launch of 131, and followed by the opportunity to prepare Discovery for her final flight later this year. That's awesome, Stephanie. It's, uh, it's a wonderful occasion. It's the end of a great process, and uh, it's an incredible process every time we get an orbiter out to the pad, and it's a, a pleasure to talk with you once again. Well, thank you. It's, it's been a wonderful processing flow, and we're looking forward to a wonderful launch and a wonderful mission. Great. Thank you again. This is shuttle launch control at T-minus three hours and holding. 47 minutes, 20 seconds remaining in this hold. Discovery is going to be carrying what has been described as a moving van in its payload bay, the Leonardo Multipurpose Logistics Module, or MPLM, is outfitted with experiment racks to enable the space station astronauts to continue maximizing their utilization of the station for science. And with us to talk about the payloads aboard Discovery is STS-128 payload manager Joe Delay. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Mike. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for being with us. Oh, it's an honor. Thank you. So you've been tracking this mission for some time, I suspect. Oh, yes. We've been working on it about a year and a half, two years. It's, it's, it's been a long time, but we're excited and we're very glad to be here, and I'm sure we'll have a good launch. Well, it's an important mission, and we're wondering if you could just fill us in a little bit uh, about the payloads for the mission. Oh, you bet. As I mentioned, we're very excited about the mission as we approach uh, assembly complete for ISS uh, these next few missions. So we're going to have the uh, MPLM, we're carrying the MPLM up, which is the uh, pressurized logistics module. It's going to have um, 16 racks. As you can see right here in the SSPF, the Space Station Processing Facility, uh, between us, Boeing, and our NASA friends, we're integrating and, and testing the module with all the uh, different science racks and storage racks that can go inside. So we'll have 16 racks, we're going to have 11 storage racks, uh, four utilization of science racks, and uh, one crew quarters rack. And then the whole weight of the uh, pressurized logistics module will be about 20,850 pounds. So in, uh, right now what we're doing is we're actually taking the racks after they've been integrated and testing them, and we're stowing them inside the uh, pressurized logistics module. And like I mentioned, we have uh, 16 racks, so this, this takes some time. And here's a picture of one of our, one of our 11 storage racks that's uh, about to be installed into the uh, pressurized logistics module. We're going to be carrying up about 7,000 pounds of stowage to uh, continue, you know, supporting our astronauts on, on the ISS. And this whole operation takes about, from beginning to end, takes about three, three and a half months before you start integrate, testing the racks, integrating them, and getting them all in, s installed into the uh, pressurized logistics module. So we're looking forward to the flight. On uh, flight day three, we're going to be docking. On flight day four, we'll actually install the module, as you can see right now, onto the ISS. In a few minutes, we'll see a picture of an ammonia tank, which we'll be installing on, on flight day seven. So this is called a zero-G storage rack, which is a rack that goes in folded. And once on orbit, it can be installed to uh, uh, expand and they can use that for uh, additional storage on the uh, International Space Station. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, here's a good picture of, of all the storage racks and some of the science racks are in the module. This external view, you can see the hatch is still open as the team prepares the module for flight. And towards the end, we have to perform all, all sorts of inspections, including a black light inspection to make sure we have no uh, FOD, no dirt inside the module. We want to keep it all clean for when it gets on space. And now we're getting prepared to, to close the hatch. And then once we close the hatch, we go ahead and pressurize the module and we declare it ready for flight. So as we mentioned, some of the racks are going to be that we've installed inside the module. One is called the Marez, which is a muscle, muscle atrophy research and exercise system. So this will perform research on the musculoskeletal system to better understand the effects of microgravity on the muscular system and this will be transferred from the module into Columbus and I mentioned the crew quarters rack. Um, this will actually the fourth time we've flown one and this will be stowed in Harmony. Now in this picture we have the ammonia tank which we call the ATA and it weighs about 4,000 pounds and its purpose is to bring up about 600 pounds of ammonia and it's used to help uh, for the cooling system of the radiators on the ISS and then once on orbit that will be placed on the S1 truss. So once we have our external carry with the ammonia tank inside the canister, we put the module, pressurized module in the canister and we'll rotate it to the horizontal position and we'll be going to the pad and install it in the payload change out room and eventually that will be installed inside the orbiter. So another rack we're flying up is called Express Rack 7 and that will be transferred to Destiny and Express Rack 7 streamlines the process of transporting experiments to the ISS. Another rack we're flying is, a, is Melfi and that is going to be installed into the GEM module and that's basically a minus 8 degree laboratory freezer and ESA built the freezer to store samples. And as we bring the canister to the pad. It takes a few hours. You have to go nice and slow. And then once we get to the pad, we'll, uh, you'll see it's being uh, lifted to the uh, payload changeout room. Another rock we're going to be flying up is called the Wharf. It's a window observation research facility. And it's almost like a dark room and it has power, data, and cooling to support the highest quality optics ever flown on a human space aircraft. So this rack will actually be installed in front of a special window in the Destiny Lab and allow the crew to perform experiments and take fantastic pictures of space and of Earth. So now we have the canister and the payload installed into the uh, into the PCR and here's a good picture of the uh, orb of the uh, payload MPLM and the LMC in the orbiter and it looks like the team is getting ready to close the doors for flight. And also besides the pressurized module and the ammonia tank, we're going to be flying up some mid-decks, some science mid-decks, and I'll just briefly mention a few of those. We're going to be flying up the space tissue loss mid-deck, which is sponsored by the Walter Reed Army Institute, and the purpose is to study the effects of microgravity on the immune system. We're going to be flying up the NPL Vaccine 8, which is a payload in support of the National Lab Pathfinder Initiative, and that will be used to examine the development of potential vaccines for prevention of infections on Earth. We'll be flying up a KSC payload called the BRIC. That's a biological research experiment which will study plants to see which are best suited for long-term space flight. Another nice one we're flying up is called the Space Seed. And that's a JAXA experiment which will yield important and useful information for improving the productivity of crops in space. So in this uh, video that you're seeing now, you'll see some of our customers at KSC integrating their experiments and test them getting ready for flights. KSC has two modern facilities in which the customer can use to integrate and test their payloads or experiments. And you can see here some of our JAXA friends are working on various experiments such as the space tissue loss which I mentioned previously and there's an experiment called the Mayo which is a study of microgravity on the muscles. And there you can see the uh, NeuroRAD which is the effects of radiation on humans. So it's, it's interesting, Mike, whether you're walking around, around your home, or you're visiting your doctor, you'll likely come into contact with a product that is a result of the technology first developed by NASA. It starts off just like this video is showing. 
So since the mid-70s, more than 1,300 NASA technologies have benefited U.S. industry, improved our quality of life, and created jobs for Americans. So as we get closer to ISS, to assembly complete, we'll continue and increase our science capability on ISS to benefit uh, mankind on Earth. It's a great story, and uh, it is going to put us on a path to continue station operations for many, many years to come. Lots of science is, is ahead of us. Uh, it's, it's great, Mike. Some examples that we've done in the past is, you know, transportable oxygen, oxygen system for air rescue. Uh, we have the ND analyzer, which is a cancer detection device. Technology used for the artificial heart. I mean, the list is really endless, and it, it all starts just like you saw in that video. So we're excited, and we're looking forward to this launch, and I'm sure it's going to be a great uh, early morning. Excellent. Thank you once again, Joe. Thank you, Mike. It's been an honor. Take care. Hi. I'm STS-131 Commander Alan Poindexter, and you're watching NASA TV. This is Shuttle Launch Control. We are now in the crew quarters at the Operations Checkout Building. Commander Alan Poindexter and the crew are getting into their orange launch and entry suits and preparing for their trip out to the pad. It's pilot Jim Dutton being assisted with his orange aces suit, getting the gloves on. Mission Specialist 1, Rick Mistracchio, looking at ease, confident and ready to fly today. And Clay Anderson, Mission Specialist number 5, a veteran of a long duration space station flight getting ready for uh, his mission. He'll be one of two spacewalkers along with Rick Mistracchio on STS-131. Mission specialist number three, Stephanie Wilson. She's a veteran of two space flights, STS-121 and STS-120. Thumbs up, she's ready to go. and our Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut, Naoko Yamazaki. A big wave for the cameras and a thumbs up. She's one of three Discovery women astronauts who will be joining a female aboard the International Space Station. There's, there's Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger. She's mission specialist number two, making her first space flight. She's a former high school science teacher turned astronaut, and she looks very excited. The crew is very nearly ready to begin their walkout to launch pad 39A, where Space Shuttle Discovery stands illuminated by xenon light, ready for a launch at 6.21 a.m. Eastern Time. And we see the astronauts for Discovery's STS-131 mission waving at the camera. Excited to be heading towards the elevator. That means they'll be on their way out to the launch pad aboard the Astrovan shortly. Several management astronauts in trailing them. Over 100 news media await the arrival of Discovery's crew, and here they are.
we see the crew now uh, out of the uh, Astro van, and they're walking over so they can better look at this beautiful space shuttle discovery. There we can see some of the venting that you were talking about. And they just need to walk a little further over here so they can get a good view. And there's another view looking down at them. Now, already inside the Space Shuttle Discovery at this point is our uh, astronaut support personnel. And see, they're, they're actually waving up to them. Right here now you have a view up on the 195 foot level and we see closeout crew member number three, that's John Hazelhurst. He's waiting for the arrival of the seven crew members from the Space Shuttle Discovery. So seven crew members from Discovery, seven members of the closeout crew. And at this time we also still have our ice team out there at the launch pad. And here we see a view from the white room, which is just outside the hatch of the uh, shuttle. And we have the commander, Alan Poindexter. Sending greetings to his family. He's a Navy captain. And he's on his second flight here. You're seeing him get into a harness this harness will hook into his parachute we have emergency survival equipment inside that harness if it looks uncomfortable it, it kind of is but we get we get used to it because we train with it so much the parachute uh, if required but we all have them in case we need them they're already in the seat uh, waiting inside the space shuttle so when he gets in we'll clip that harness right into uh, the parachute and as traditionally uh, happens, the commander will be the first to board. We now have a view inside the Space Shuttle Discovery. And you also heard that the commander is on board. That call was from the closeout crew, letting the Launch Control Center team know that Commander Poindexter is on board. And now we see Mission Specialist Clay Anderson Clay will be sitting on the mid-deck. So uh, here they've got his uh, parachute harness on him, and they're just uh, putting in some uh, light sticks. Clay's giving a shout-out to all his family and friends. Clay's just put on his communications cap. Inside that cap, you have uh, earphones on both sides, and we also have microphones that uh, come across, and he'll strap all that on. Once he gets into his seat, we'll plug that, that whole system into the communication system and we'll be able to uh, talk to him. We'll actually hear that in a little while. As each crew member hooks into their communication system, they want to check that out and they'll actually do a comm check. We've changed the view, view back now. As you see, uh, Alan Poindexter, the commander, in his seat. And if he looks like he's laying down, well, he kind of is because with the orbiter in the vertical position, the seats are, are back. So you're actually laying on your back. We've got a view of our pilot, Jim Dutton. This is ISL. Jim is one of the uh, rookie flyers. That's correct. He's on his first flight, but boy, you'd never know it. He has been training for so long for this, and he's just a natural at it. Copy. Well, he certainly has a lot of uh, flying experience. He has over 3,300 hours in more than 30 different aircraft, to his credit. Now we actually have a view from inside the mid-deck of the space shuttle. And we see the uh, insertion tech number seven. That's Ray Cuevas in the white suit with the number seven on the back. He's actually strapping in mission specialist Clay Anderson into the mid-deck. Back to the flight deck with a, a view of Alan Poindexter. And if you look close, you can kind of see two people working around there. They're helping uh, strap him in and also place all of his equipment where he can properly reach it. And as you can imagine, uh, with all the vibration that we experience with launch, it's important that uh, the different small items that we might need, like a checklist or even a pen or a pencil, is uh, nearby with either a good bit of Velcro or at least a tether, because we don't want things flying loose in there as, as we rattle on up to orbit. In your view right now, uh, on the uh, closer part of the view, you see uh, Stephanie Wilson. 
Uh, yep, Stephanie's uh, making her third space flight. She flew on STS-121 first and STS-120 second. She has a bachelor's degree from Harvard and a master's degree from the University of Texas. And is mission specialist three on this mission. And she's also quite the wizard at operating robotic arms. Hey, now we got uh, Stephanie Wilson giving a, a shout out uh, to her family. And that's always a, a fun thing to do to, uh, you know that your family and friends are all watching and, and be able to acknowledge that uh, you appreciate them watching and you appreciate all their support because they've been supporting quite a long time when these crews have been putting in a lot of long hours and, and it's really wonderful to know we have that great support team behind us. NTD, CDR, com check. CDR, this is NTD. I've got you loud and clear. Good morning, Dex. Good morning, Steve. Got you loud and clear as well. Houston, CDR, com check. CDR, Houston, we read you loud and clear. Good morning, Dex. Good morning, CJ, to you and everybody in the Mission Control Center. I've got you out loud and clear. And Rick Mastracchio is getting ready to board. In the meantime, we just changed our view back to inside the crew module on the flight deck. Now you're seeing our pilot. So we actually moved the camera over to the other side. And we're seeing uh, our pilot, Jim Dutton. He also goes by call sign MASH. So uh, MASH is getting all strapped into uh, his seat. And he'll be ready to uh, do his voice checks momentarily. That's correct. Once uh, once we get his helmet on him and his gloves and uh, gets them all uh, get them all strapped in, uh, we'll hear the similar comm checks from him. As you can imagine, uh, it's it's actually very critical to make sure that we can communicate with each of the crew members. Back uh, in the white room with Rick Mastracchio. This will be his third flight. He's mission specialist number one, and he and Clay Anderson will be conducting all three of the spacewalks on the mission. Back now to this view on the mid-deck. We see Stephanie Wilson climbing up into her seat. Her seat on the mid-deck is actually the one that's closest to the hatch. There are three seats located on the mid-deck, and you can see Clay Anderson is closest to us, and then there's another seat in the center that's uh, not quite visible right now. And there's Naoko Yamazaki. This is a big day for Naoko and for the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. She's their second female astronaut, and she will be flying to the space station and joining a fellow uh, JAXA astronaut, Suichi Naguchi. Naoko is making her first flight. She was selected by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency as an astronaut in 1999. The view that you're seeing now is in the flight deck of the space shuttle. We've moved the camera now. It was over there right by our pilot, Jim Dutton, but now we've moved it to the very center of the uh, dash, if you will, up by the windshield, looking back down. And so that way we'll be able to see if you, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but look closely, it's a little bit dark. You see Rick Mastracchio is uh, in his seat and he's being strapped in. And that would be on the left side uh, of your view. Here's Dottie Metcalf Lindenberger. She is a, a rookie. She is uh, one of three former school teachers selected as mission specialists in the 2004 educator astronaut class, along with Joe Acaba and Ricky Arnold, who both flew aboard Discovery on STS-119 in March 2009. MS-5, OTC, I've got you loud and clear. Good morning, Clay. Good morning, Lori, I have you the same. NTD, MS-5, comp check. MS-5, this is NTD, I've got you loud and clear. Good morning, Clay. Good morning, Steve, I have you the same, sir.
Houston, MS-5, com check. MS-5, Houston, we read you loud and clear. Good morning, Clay. CJ, I have you the same. OTC, OVCC. Go ahead. MS-4 on board at this time. GMT-0743. And this is uh, back to the flight deck now with MS-1 Rick Mastracchio, and uh, we're seeing him close and lock his visor. We'll hear his communications checks. MS-1, com check. MS-1, this is NTD. I have you loud and clear. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, Steve. Loud and clear also. Houston, MS-1, com check. MS-1, Houston, we read you loud and clear. Good morning, Rick. Good morning, CJ. Loud and clear also. This view is back to the mid-deck, and it's a little tough to see, but Nauco is in the center of all of that uh, orange that you see, and uh, she's getting positioned into her seat. although this is a dark view, and the very center of your uh, view right now is uh, Dottie, or MS-2, sitting uh, in her seat, and they're working to fasten all of her seat belts and strap her in. And Discovery, during the Astrocom checks, adjust appropriate volume control for comfort. Do not change the audio panel switch configuration. Discovery copies. And Discovery, this is the OTC with a comm check on air to ground one. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, MS-1. MS-2, MS-3, MS-4, MS-5. I copy all and switching to air to ground two. And uh, certainly we'll keep you posted on uh, what's going on at uh, Kennedy Space Center and what's going on is uh, something uh, quite extraordinary because we only have four left. And of course I'm talking about uh, the space shuttle program which uh, will be retired after, well, after this one, three more flights and then that is it. There you are watching uh, live pictures on your right of the White Room, the seal. The hatch uh, has been sealed and the astronauts are safely aboard uh, their uh, crew there. And uh, so we're going to continue to count this down. We have uh, just a few hours away. 621 uh, local time will be the launch time. And as far as uh, weather uh, constraints, we're looking pretty good. Southeast satellite perspective looking uh, just fine here. This is what you want uh, when you're trying to get a space shuttle into the uh, sky. Usually during uh, the summer months, very difficult to get them up. There's usually when you uh, have them scheduled in the afternoon, you get those thunderstorms bubbling up. This time of year, we usually get cold fronts moving through and that's what uh, would be the concern but I don't see anything uh, that would be a problem here weatherwise in the uh, morning at 621 so we'll call it uh, mostly go mostly clear east uh, 15 uh, kilometer per hour winds and uh, we are going to be talking about uh, temperatures uh, right around 18 uh, degrees so hopefully we'll get another uh, spectacular pre-dawn uh, launch uh, here coming up in just a few hours we'll bring it to you live here on CNN Don yes indeed Ivan very much looking forward to that can't wait uh, and that's it for World Report. Thanks for watching. I'm Don Rodell. I'll be right back with an update of the news headlines. And then it's time for World View. Stay with us here on CNN. We're still at uh, 15 PSI on panel of one. In the shuttle discovery is in the final moments before liftoff as the program itself winds down. This is shuttle launch control at T minus nine minutes and holding. Eight minutes, 25 seconds remain in the hold. And as Space Shuttle Discovery prepares for launch, the International Space Station, traveling about 220 miles above the Earth, is on a 51.6 degree inclination to the equator. The shuttle launch time is based on the time that the Earth's rotation carries Kennedy Space Center's launch pad into the plane of the space station's orbit.
And right now, as we speak, the space station is approaching Kennedy. For residents and visitors in the Space Coast area, it will be visible for about three minutes, beginning momentarily. It should appear from the south to southwest and move to the east, peaking at about 43 degree elevation in the sky. And at the time of liftoff, just minutes away, the space station moving at 17,500 miles per hour, or five miles a second, will have moved to out over the Atlantic Ocean, southwest of Ireland. Mission Control in Houston is sending NASA television to the members of the space station crew so they can watch the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. And we see the space station traveling over the Kennedy Space Center on NASA television. It just passed the moon. A bright, a bright dot in the sky. Uh, residents throughout the world can find sighting opportunities by going to NASA's website at www.nasa.gov and looking for sightings. The space station is longer than a football field. Its solar arrays span 240 feet and it's 45 feet tall. It's a large object. It's getting bigger all the time. Six permanent crew members are there today, about to be joined by the seven crew members of Space Shuttle Discovery to conduct science in space. JRPS, go ahead. L minus 15 recorder activation. Copy. At this time, the International Space Station is about 90% complete by mass and 98% complete by habitable volume. Copy, we'll put in work. MS-1 and MS-4 OTC, activate V-10 recorders. The chase will be on beginning at 6.21 a.m. and 25 seconds when Space Shuttle Discovery begins to track the International Space Station. OTC? OTC is go. TBC? TBC is go. PTC? PTC is go. LPS? LPS is go. Houston flight? Houston flight is go. Mila? Mila is go. STM? STM is go. Safety console? Safety console is go. SPE? SP is go. LRD? LRD is go. SRO? This is SRO, please stand by. And CDR? Discovery is go. NTD SRO? Go ahead. SRO is go. You have range clear to launch. Copy. Go from SRO. Thank you. And launch director, NTD. Launch director, go ahead. Launch team is ready to proceed. I copy that. I will conduct my poll. KSC processing, chief engineer, verify no constraints to launch. No constraints. Copy that. Thank you, Steve. KSC shuttle, safety mission assurance. KSC uh, SMMA is go for launch, Pete. Copy, Terry. Thank you. Payload launch manager. DPI says processing team is go. Copy, thank you, Bill. Range further. Further has no constraints for launch. Copy, thank you. Kathy, and ops manager. Pete, looks like a great morning. You're go to launch 131. Uh, copy that. Thank you, sir. Discovery, launch director. Go ahead, sir. Well, Bex, vehicle is clean, weather is good, and this team is ready. It is time for you to rise to orbit. Good luck and Godspeed. Thanks, Pete. Uh, the crew of STS-131 is really honored to represent the thousands of dedicated people that make up all the entire NASA, JAXA, and contractor workforces. We're flying on the most capable and versatile spacecraft ever built, and we'll see you in a few weeks. Let's do it. Copy that. Thank you, sir. NTD, launch director, you do have a go to launch Discovery. Copy, thank you. Go to proceed with count. T-minus eight minutes and counting. 
Pilot Jim Dutton is now flipping switches in the cockpit to directly connect the three fuel cells to the essential power buses. OTC, PLT, essential buses connected to fuel cells. Copy. Good news, all three fuel cells operating normally. T minus seven minutes, 30 seconds. For orbiter access arm retract. And discovery, OTC, it's time to light up the skies on your mission to expand scientific research on the International Space Station. So lack rookies to ride a shuttle. This vehicle is about to go 17,000 miles per hour. Enjoy your ride. Discovery copies. Thanks a lot. Best wishes from orbiter test conductor Lori Sally to the crew of Space Shuttle Discovery. T minus seven minutes and counting. The orbiter access arm has been retracted away from Discovery. This is the walkway used by the crew to gain entry into and out of the shuttle, and it can be returned to position within seconds should it become necessary. T minus six minutes, 30 seconds and counting. KRPS, start APU display recorders. APU recorders are running. TLT, perform APU pre-start. TLT and work. Orbiter test conductor gave pilot Jim Dutton a go to perform the auxiliary power unit pre-start procedure. The APUs provide pressure to the shuttle's three hydraulic systems, which move the main engines and aero surfaces during flight. The final test of the flight control surfaces is being conducted. This is a program pattern of movements designed to verify the readiness for launch of all the flight control surfaces, the elevons, speed brakes, and rudder. And the main engines are being gimbled, gimbled through a pre-programmed series of maneuvers as a final test before launch. T minus three minutes, 15 seconds and counting. T minus two minutes, 39 seconds and counting. TLT, clear caution and warning memory, verify no unexpected errors. Okay, let's go over to Andy Gallagher. Well, he joined us here in Florida about two minutes before the launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, and this should be a spectacular launch. The last time the shuttle will go up at twilight, just those few moments before dawn, so this should be a spectacular sight, and one of only a handful of shuttle flights left. We've got so used to watching this iconic orbiter take off over the last almost 30 years now, but as usual, this mission is once again to replenish the International Space Station. They'll be taking up more equipment uh, to that International Space Station. They'll uh, rendezvous with it on Wednesday. And once they do that, the crew of the, uh, the, uh, the, the orbiting space uh, laboratory will be up to 13, including for the first time in history, four women serving in space. Uh, so this is uh, quite a momentous moment. There are people from all over the states gathered around Cape Canaveral to watch this for the last time a shuttle going up at night. It's quite a spectacular sight. The last time we'll get to see it, we have really uh, begun to, to watch this over the last 30 years. An amazing sight. And as I said, they will be uh, taking up equipment to the International Space Station, one of only three or four uh, launches left, and almost on the 29th anniversary of the shuttle program itself. Uh, so we're just watching the pictures there at NASA. As you can see, uh, we are about 45 minutes before sunrise here in Florida. And as it goes up, the shuttle should actually begin to catch the first rays of the sun as it comes up over America's east coast. In fact, thousands, if not tens of thousands of people, will actually be able to watch the launch this morning uh, because as it goes up, it will be a clear sight across most of the eastern seaboard. And in fact, uh, NASA is saying the weather this morning perfect. The only worry they had was that there may be some fog around. But as you can see from the pictures here, it seems to be perfectly clear here at Cape Canaveral in Florida. So we are just waiting now uh, for the last few seconds. I think we've got about 40 seconds left before the launch. Seven astronauts on board there. Uh, uh, President Barack Obama actually due here in Florida in a couple of days' time to talk about NASA's future. This, of course, is really the end of an era. There are only two or three 
more shuttle missions after this one. So we'll just watch the countdown. T-minus 15 seconds and the sound suppression water system has been activated. We have a go for main start. Three engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. There you go. What a spectacular sight. This is the last time any of us will get to watch something like this. The Space Shuttle Discovery blasting off from Florida about 40 minutes before the first rays of the sun seen here on the East Coast. Quite a spectacular sight, one that can be seen across the East Coast of America. Many, many people will be watching this. Many people here on holiday actually lining the roads around Cape Canaveral to watch this. One of the last few flights of the, uh, of the space shuttle. It will be in space for about 13 days. It will carry out three spacewalks, once again, delivering more equipment to that International Space Station. And once these orbiters have finished going up, that responsibility for keeping the International Space Station equipped will fall onto people like the Russians and the Chinese. But what a spectacular sight. That's the last time any of us will get to see anything like that. It's been 29 years since these uh, shuttles have been taking off from here in Florida, something we've all got used to. But now that program is drawing to a close in the autumn of this year, the entire shuttle fleet will be retired. And that is Andy Gallagher bringing us uh, the very latest on the successful launch of the uh, Discovery there at Cape Canaveral. Left, uh, is there, Murray? Does it light up the whole sky around you? You know what? It looked as, the, as if it was the biggest sunrise you had ever seen. It was a huge ball of fire on the horizon. We are standing about five miles away from uh, the launch pad, and I can still see it here in the sky. It's still very, very bright, um, brighter than any firework that you could imagine. Even now, all this time, I can still see Discovery up in the sky. In, in front of us, all we had was uh, the water, the Banana River, and then the launch pad. So we had a crystal clear view of what was going on, and so did the 10,000 people that are out here doing this with us at the Kennedy Space Center. It was really and amazing. Mari, as, as you're speaking to us, it may be too high for you to see now, but the two solid rocket boosters have just detached from the space shuttle, which, uh, from my understanding, means it's already cleared about 28 miles. It's already 150,000 feet uh, up in the sky. It looks uh, at this point as if the launch has gone exactly to plan. The two main rockets have separated. Yes. Uh, Mari Ramos, thanks very much uh, for sharing your experience there. And let's bring in Jenny Harrison, who's at the International uh, Weather Center for us. Uh, Jenny, uh, looks like they had a perfect day for it. I know, finally. And thank you for Mari, too, and her family, actually, Don, because uh, they did go for the last launch. And, of course, it was cancelled in the last few minutes. So, yes, the weather, for once, fully cooperated. And, of course, talking to weather conditions. And the gaseous oxygen vent hood, or beanie cap, is being retracted away from the top of the external tank. T minus two minutes, 20 seconds and counting. Discovery, close the launch visors, initiate O2 flow. Discovery copies visors and O2 flow. T minus two minutes and counting. Liquid hydrogen replenish on the external tank is now being terminated. go for ET LH2 pressurization. T minus one minute, 44 seconds and counting. All systems are go. One minute, 30 seconds. 90 seconds away from the launch of Space Shuttle Discovery. minus one minute 15 seconds and counting T minus one minute. one minute the ground launch sequencer will verify that the three main engines are ready to start 
the booster joint heaters are being uh, deactivated at this time. We're transferring to orbiter internal power. Discovery is now running off of its three onboard fuel cells. T minus 38 seconds and counting. Coming up on a go for auto sequence start. TLS is go for auto sequence start. T minus 25 seconds. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of the vehicle's critical functions. 20 seconds. T-minus 15 seconds, and the sound suppression water system has been activated. Okay. We have a go for main chain start. Three engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. at an altitude of 4.7 miles or 26,500 feet and traveling. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Traveling 1,000 miles per hour, Discovery's engines are now throttled back up and performing at full capability. The shuttle weighed more than four and a half million pounds, and now uh, one minute and 27 seconds into the flight, the main engines and solid rocket boosters have reduced that weight by about half. The solid rocket, bo rocket boosters alone are burn burning 11,000 pounds of propellant per second, and the external tank is now 3,000 pounds lighter than when it began. Discovery is now 21 miles away from its launch pad and uh, 22 miles in altitude, traveling 2,700 miles per hour. All three main engines are working just as expected. The three fuel cells are generating power and the three auxiliary power units are all producing pressure. In short, everything performing well. Two minutes and seven seconds into the STS-131 mission. The booster officer in the mission control center has confirmed the solid rocket booster separation. All systems continuing to continuing to function well. Two orbital maneuvering system engines on Discovery's tail are now firing as well, providing the shuttle an extra boost into orbit. The engine burn will last one minute and 44 seconds. Discovery, two engine tail. Discovery copies, two engine tail. That call indicates that Discovery can now reach Moron in Spain should one of the three main engines fail. However, all three of those main engines are currently working well. Two minutes and 59 seconds into the flight, and Discovery is now 79 miles away from Kennedy Space Center in Florida, 48 miles in altitude, and traveling at 4,500 miles per hour. Space Shuttle Discovery also seeing the first of many sunrises of the STS-131 mission. Discovery Houston, you are negative return. Discovery copies, negative return. 
Discovery is now flying too high and too fast to return to the Kennedy Space Center in the event of an engine fail failure. That's not currently a problem, however, as all engines are continuing to perform as expected. Four minutes and 15 seconds into Discovery's flight. Shuttle's traveling 6,000 miles per hour at an altitude of 63 miles and uh, is 181 miles away from Kennedy Space Center. Environmental Systems Officer here in Mission Controls confirmed that the flash evaporator system has been activated to provide cooling to the shuttle system until the shuttle's cargo bay doors open and uh, double as radiators. Discovery, press to ATO. Discovery copies, press to ATO. Should two of the shuttle's three main engines fail after this point, it can still reach a safe, though lower than planned orbit, as that call from Capcom Rick Sturko indicated. Discovery is now five three. minutes and 42 minutes Discovery, seconds into its flight. Ops three. Discovery, single engine Ops 3. 67 miles in altitude and 351 miles away from Kennedy Space Center, Discovery could still make it across the Atlantic for an abort landing, even if two of the three... Three main engines failed at this point. All engines are performing well. Discovery, single engine, Zaragoza. Discovery, copy, single engine, Zaragoza. Discovery now flying more than 10,000 miles per hour. 66 miles in altitude and 430 miles away from Kennedy Space Center. Discovery, press to Miko. Discovery copies, press to Miko. And that call indicates that Discovery can reach its planned orbit of 136 by 36 statute miles, even if one of the engines fails. All three engines are still working well, as are the auxiliary power units and the three fuel cells. Discovery, you are single engine press. Your shutdown plan is nominal. Go for the plus X, go for the pitch maneuver. Copy, nominal shutdown plan. Go for the plus X, go for the pitch. Even if two engines were to fail at this point, Discovery could still make its planned orbit with just one. That shouldn't be necessary, however, as all three engines are still performing at full capability. Also, Capcom Rick Sturkow there letting Commander Alan Poindexter know that Discovery will cut off its three main engines as planned and that he has the go-ahead then to pitch Discovery up to allow for photos of the external tank to be taken after its external, after its separation. Discovery now seven minutes and 48 seconds into its uh, mission, traveling at 15,000 miles per hour. 63 miles in altitude and 730 miles downrange from Kennedy Space Center. Booster officer here in Mission Control is reporting that Discovery's three main engines have been shut off. We're now waiting for external tank separation. Discovery Houston, nominal Miko, Ohms 1 is not required. Nominal Miko, Ohms 1 not required. And there is the external tank separation. Eight minutes and 53 seconds into the STS-130 mission. Discovery now safely in orbit. 66 miles above the Earth, and traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. Also, uh, 1,065 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center.
Commander Alan Poindexter is uh, maneuvering the vehicle into position to take some photos of the external tank now separated from Space Shuttle Discovery. The tank provided fuel to the shuttle's three main engines for its climb into space. It weighed 1.6 million pounds at liftoff, but with the main engines sucking fuel out of it at a rate that would drain an average swimming pool in about 25 seconds. It uh, was just about empty and weighed less than 11,000 pounds by the time it separated from Discovery. Discovery's onboard computers have primary control of the vehicle's critical functions. 20 seconds. T-minus 15 seconds and the sound suppression water system has been activated. We have a go for main engine start. Three engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery Roll Program. Roger roll, Discovery. This is Mission Control Houston. Space Shuttle Discovery is rolling into a heads down position, putting it on course for 51.6 degree, 136 by 36 statute line orbit, and eventually the International Space Station. are now throttling down to reduce stress on the shuttle as it travels through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Discovery is already at an altitude of 4.7 miles or 26,500 feet. And traveling. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Traveling 1,000 miles per hour, Discovery's engines are now throttled back up and performing at full ca capability. At liftoff, the shuttle weighed more than four and a half million pounds, and now uh, one minute and 27 seconds into the flight, the main engines and solid rocket boosters have reduced that weight by about half. The solid rocket, bo rocket boosters alone are burn burning 11,000 pounds of propellant per second, and the external tank is now 3,000 pounds louder than when it began. Discovery is now 21 miles away from its launch pad and uh, 22 miles in altitude, traveling 2,700 miles per hour. All three main engines are working just as expected. The three fuel cells are generating power and the three auxiliary power units are all producing pressure. In short, everything performing well. Two minutes and seven seconds into the STS-131 mission. The booster officer in the mission control center has confirmed the solid rocket booster separation. All systems continuing to continuing to function well. Two orbital maneuvering system engines on Discovery's tail are now firing as well, providing the shuttle an extra boost into orbit. The engine burn will last one minute and 44 seconds. 20 seconds. T-minus 15 seconds and the sound suppression water system has been activated. We have a go for main engine start. Three engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery Roll Program. Bye to roll, Discovery. This is Mission Control Houston. Space Shuttle Discovery is rolling into a heads down position, putting it on course for 51.6 degree, 136 by 36 statute line orbit, and eventually the International Space Station. Discovery's three liquid fueled main engines are now throttling down to reduce stress on the shuttle as it travels through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Discovery is already at an altitude of 4.7 miles or 26,500 feet. 
Traveling. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Traveling 1,000 miles per hour. Discovery's engines are now throttled back up and performing at full cut capability. Had lift off the shuttle weighed more than four and a half million pounds and now uh, one minute and 27 seconds into the flight, the main engines and solid rocket boosters have reduced that weight by about half. The solid rocket, bo rocket boosters alone are burn burning 11,000 pounds of propellant per second and the external tank is now 3,000 pounds lighter than when it began. Discovery is now 21 miles away from its launch pad and uh, 22 miles in altitude traveling 2,700 miles per hour. All three main engines are working just as expected. The three fuel cells are generating power and the three auxiliary power units are all producing pressure. In short, everything performing well. Two minutes and seven seconds into the STS-131 mission. The booster officer in the mission control center has confirmed the solid rocket booster separation. All systems continuing to continuing to function well. T minus 15 seconds and the sound suppression water system has been activated. Okay. We have a go for main engine start. Three engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and lift off 20 seconds. T-minus 15 seconds and the sound suppression water system has been activated. Okay. We have a go for main engine start. Three engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. And liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery Roll Program. Bye to roll, Discovery. This is Mission Control Houston. Space Shuttle Discovery is rolling into a heads down position, putting it on course for 51.6 degree, 136 by 36 statute line orbit, and eventually the International Space Station. are now throttling down to reduce stress on the shuttle as it travels through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Discovery is already at an altitude of 4.7 miles or 26,500 feet and traveling. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Traveling 1,000 miles per hour, Discovery's engines are now throttled back up and performing at full capability. Had lift off the shuttle weighed more than four and a half million pounds and now uh, one minute and 27 seconds into the flight, the main engines and solid rocket boosters have reduced that weight by about half. The solid rocket, bo rocket boosters alone are burn burning 11,000 pounds of propellant per second and the external tank is now 3,000 pounds lighter than when it began. Discovery is now 21 miles away from its launch pad and uh, 22 miles in altitude traveling 2,700 miles per hour. All three main engines are working just as expected. The three fuel cells are generating power and the three auxiliary power units are all producing pressure. In short, everything performing well. Two minutes and seven seconds into the STS-131 mission. The booster officer in the mission control center has confirmed the solid rocket booster. Go for main engine start. Engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery Roll Program. Bye, 
Discovery, blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery, roll program. Bye, to roll Discovery. This is Mission Control Houston. Space Shuttle Discovery is rolling into a heads down position, putting it on course for 51.6 degree, 136 by 36 statute line orbit, and eventually the International Space Station. throttling down to reduce stress on the shuttle as it travels through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Discovery is already at an altitude of 4.7 miles or 26,500 feet. And traveling. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. Traveling 1,000 miles per hour, Discovery's engines are now throttled back up and performing at full ca capability. At lift off, the shuttle weighed more than four and a half million pounds, and now uh, one minute and 27 seconds into the flight, the main engines and solid rocket boosters have reduced that weight by about half. The solid rocket, bo rocket boosters alone are burn burning 11,000 pounds of propellant per second, and the external tank is now 3,000 pounds lighter than when it began. Discovery is now 21 miles away from its launch pad and uh, 22 miles in altitude, traveling 2,700 miles per hour. All three main engines are working just as expected. The three fuel cells are generating power and the three auxiliary power units are all producing pressure. In short, everything performing well. Two minutes and seven seconds into the STS-131 mission. The booster officer in the mission control center has confirmed the solid rocket booster separation. All systems continuing to continuing to function well. We have a go for main engine start. Three engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery roll program. Bye to roll Discovery. Discovery is rolling into a heads down position, putting it on course for 51.6 degree, 136 by 36 statute line orbit, and eventually the International Space Station. Discovery's three liquid fueled main engines are now. System has been activated. We have a go for main engine start. Engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery roll program. Bye, Jerome. And the sound suppression water system has been activated. Okay. We have a go for main engine start. Engines up and ready. Three, two, one, zero. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery. Blazing a trail to scientific discoveries aboard space station. Houston Discovery roll program. Bye to roll Discovery. This is Mission Control Houston. Space Shuttle Discovery is rolling into a heads down position, putting it on course for 51.6 degree, 136 by 36 statute line orbit, and eventually the International Space Station. Discovery's 
three liquid fueled main engines are now throttling down to reduce stress on the shuttle as it travels through the area of maximum dynamic pressure discovery is already at an altitude of four point seven miles or twenty six thousand five hundred feet and traveling discovery go at throttle up roger go at throttle up Traveling 1,000 miles per hour, Discovery's engines are now throttled back up and performing at full ca capability. Had lift off the shuttle weighed more than four and a half million pounds and now uh, one minute and 27 seconds into the flight, the main engines and solid rocket boosters have reduced that weight by about half. Solid rocket, bo rocket boosters alone are burning, burning 11,000 pounds of propellant per second, and the external tank is now 3,000 pounds lighter than when it began. Discovery is now 21 miles away from its launch pad and uh, 22 miles in altitude, traveling 2,700 miles per hour. All three main engines are working just as expected. The three fuel cells are generating power, and the three auxiliary power units are all producing pressure. In short, everything performing well. Two minutes and seven seconds into the STS-131 mission. The booster officer in the mission control center has confirmed the solid rocket booster separation. All systems continuing to, continuing to function well. Observation, clear skies, 10 miles visibility, though the SLS observer is still reporting the shallow fog. Winds 130 at 2. How did the uh, STA characterize that? said it was not approaching the, uh, the nav aids and that it was down really towards the, the water and very shallow. Shallow, not an issue. And, and not an issue, nor do I expect it to be. Is it, do we expect it to get worse or to get better? Really stay the same till probably uh, around sunrise or so. But I'm also looking at the, uh, some of the tower visibilities and they're not going down, so uh, we're looking really good with that. Okay, so no, no expectation that'll get any worse, right? Affirmative. What is your dew point spread? Well, our temperature is 57 and dew point is 57, but it's the same as what it was last night at this time as well. So it's probably more, we're getting more uh, dew than anything else. Okay, and it is uh, 5.30, 5.45 out there, an hour and a half prior to sunrise? Affirmative. And you think that the uh, fog's not going to get any worse than it is currently? And negative, not with the uh, light southeast winds, that's very favorable for us right now. If they were westerly, there would be more concern, but uh, with the southeast wind, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to get uh, too much fog there. Okay, so winds are going to prevent any worse fog. Affirmative. Spreads five to six degrees. And a temperature dew point spread I gave you was at the surface, up about the 54 feet. There is about a five degree spread. We'll forecast uh, and, and go OBS at, uh, at KSC and also at Zaragoza and Maroon, so two TAL sites are available. Everything's shaping up to be a good day to launch, but I do want to come around the room, get your go, no go one more time. So go, no go for launch, down, starting down front, GC. Go. Guidance. Go, and uh, Fido's going to have an update for the uh, Zergos attack in. Fido. Go. We'll talk to you about it later. Prop. Go. GNC. Go. Max. Go. Eagle. Go. Ecom. Go. FAO. Go. Uh, ACO. Go. DPS. Go. Enco. Go. Uh, PDRS. Go. Surgeon. Go. Booster. Go. PAO. Go. All right, Capcom. Go. We are go for launch. All right. Fido, what's the story in the Zergos attack in? It does continue with intermittent alarms, and the techs right now are recommending that we call that tech in no-go. He thinks he may be able to fix it, but till he gets in there and, and does that, he's recommending that tech can be considered failed. Is this the dual string? So both, both sides are failed? 
Yes, sir. Guidance, do we have a good backup for there? Uh, for that fight, flight, no, it's just a DME. So by the rules, we can't uh, use that. Marone, though, that is a single string in the primary slot and a dual string in the secondary. So we'd be go with Marone. So based on tech end status, we're declaring there goes a no go. That is what the techs are recommending with the tech end there. Flight, still getting a story together. Okay. Um, I'd rather have an intermittent tech end than no tech end. So what is intermittent? Do we have a feel for the frequency of? Still trying to get that story flight. Okay. Copy. Go with Maroon. I'd rather they not fiddle with it. To be honest with you, at this point, unless it's more than 50 percent down. Yes, sir. Can you characterize, please, the reports from the STA pilot? I sure can. Uh, the STA pilot has uh, done runs to both runways 15 and the primary 33. In both uh, cases, uh, uh, visibility of the landing aids was, uh, was excellent. Uh, there was no apparent impact uh, from uh, observed uh, shallow ground fog, so no issues there. Uh, for runway 33, uh, with one of the xenons out, uh, there was no observed change there either, so that visibility is good down that runway. Um, workload was low to both sides, and so uh, from the SDA standpoint, uh, either runway is a, uh, a great runway to go to, and um, uh, we could go to either one. Okay, good deal, thank you. JRPS, go ahead. Uh, minus 15 to quarter activation. Copy. Houston flight. Houston flight. Two step 1121. L minus 15 to quarter activation. Copy. We'll put in work. MS1 and MS4 OTC activate V10 recorders. Flight will put it in work. Copy. MS1, that's complete. TBC. TBC is go. PTC. PTC is go. LPS. LPS is go. Houston flight. Houston flight is go. Mila. Mila is go. STM. STM is a go. Safety console. Safety console is go. Final flight, flight. Yes, sir. Your abort software up and running? Yes, sir, it is. GC, are we FSM enabled? Any form to fly. Okay, I'm going to enable on my end. And we see your abort's enabled. I know. We're going to make it a two engine towel call. Copy. Two engine towel. Flight booster, three engines ready. Copy. If need be, we'll go back to Maroon. 25. 20. 15. All vents open. 10. Copy. PLS is go for main engine start. Houston Discovery Roll Program. Roger Roll. Roger Roll Discovery. Flight guidance, good roll maneuver. Copy, good roll. Three, one, four. Go with throttle up. Discovery, go at throttle up. Roger, go at throttle up. On PDO. Copy PDO. That should be set. Copy set. 103 converged. Copy. System progress, two good engines. Copy, two good ohms engines. Oh, Mila. Two engine towel. Two engine towel. Discovery, two engine towel. Discovery copies, two engine towel. Press ATO. Discovery, press to ATO. Discovery, press to 
Delta copies. Puff to ATO. Two minutes to Tedris. Copy. Single engine ops three. Discovery, you are single engine ops three. Discovery, single engine ops three. Rolling heads up. Single engine Zaragoza 104. Discovery, single engine Zaragoza. Discovery, copy, single engine Zaragoza. See, booster, what kind of shutdown plan are we looking at? Nominal shutdown plan, fine, everything looks good here. Nominal shutdown, excellent. And prop, go for the plus X and the pitch. Go for both. Press to Miko. Discovery, press to Miko. Discovery copies, press to Miko. 3G throttling on three, and flight we did lose one vibe sensor on the uh, left engine. Still have a good red line there. It's on the fuel pump. Copy, just DQ'd one of the sensors. That's firm. Home teachers. Nominal Miko, ohms one is not required. Copy, yep. Discovery Houston, nominal Miko, ohms one is not required. Nominal Miko, ohms one not required. Okay, folks, on over the post ohms one pr procedures. ETSEP. Copy, ETSEP. Fido for the ohms two burned, uh, what's our TIG? Uh, preliminary 37 minutes even. Okay, just take what we load or you want them to load that on top? Let's take a look at what comes up flight. Get to the MPS dump, I'll have a better idea. Flight boost, flight boost your MPS dump just started. And work. The TVC is closed, we'll go for AP hide shutdown. Okay, kept coming, give them go for AP hide shutdown. Discovery Houston, you are go for APU hydraulic shutdown. Discovery copies, go for APU hydraulic shutdown. Here it comes, CJ. Max is watching you, Mash. Dex on page uh, 3-4, tail only control is not required. Everything else will be as written and we'll be ready for 105 when you get to the bottom. Discovery copy, Houston, uh, tail only control not required and uh, everything else as written on page 3-4. Apply DPS. Go. Uh, I could go for our post uh, Miko Timbos. You have that go? Let's see booster 3-6 as written. That's firm flight. And then uh, max 3-7 as written. As written flight. Good morning, and welcome to the post-launch news conference for Space Shell Discovery's STS-131 mission to the International Space Station. Joining us here today to discuss Discovery's liftoff is Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Bill Gerstmeyer. Good morning. Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency President, Kagi Tachikawa. Space Shuttle Program Launch Integration Manager and Mission Management Team Chairman, Mike Moses. Morning. And STS-131 Space Shuttle Launch Director, Pete Nikolenko. Good morning. We'll start with questions, excuse me, we'll start with opening remarks uh, here at Kennedy and then take your questions, Mr. Gerstmeyer. Thanks, John. It's a great day today. Uh, you got to see a, an unbelievably great launch. Uh, you also got to see Space Station fly overhead, which was kind of an extra special treat for us all. So again, it's a really a tribute to the team here in Florida that got the vehicle ready to go fly. Um, they did a tremendous job of process and discovery and, and getting the vehicle out to the launch pad and, and working through uh, some, some issues uh, as we went forward. Uh, things went extremely well during ascent. We saw maybe three little foam loss events all around four minutes or so. Um, we don't think those are problematic. The teams will review the, uh, the video some more, and, and that worked pretty good. We also had an accelerometer on the main engine, and Mike can talk to you a little bit more about that. And again, that was not a concern to us. It was one of three measurements. So the vehicle was extremely clean. The teams did a tremendous job of getting the vehicle ready to go fly. 
Uh, the mission will be a very challenging mission, as you've seen from the timelines, the activities, the uh, MPLM work will be busy, but the crew's ready to go do it, and uh, we'll, we'll see how the mission goes throughout. But a great start to a great mission. So thank you. Yeah, <coughs> thank you. It's uh, my great pleasure to be here today and to be able to witness the launch, uh, successful launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery on board with the uh, Japanese astronaut Mrs. Yamazaki Blue. STS-131 mission is her first space flight. Her main duty during this mission is to operate two kinds of uh, robotic arms. She will connect a logistic module Leonard to the ISS, then rem remove it and put it back. So, <coughs> and uh, inside the space shuttle's cargo bay. I'm confident that astronaut Yamazaki will be able to accomplish her duty successfully as she prepared well through her hard training. Since 1992, when the first Japanese astronaut, Dr. Mori, flew on the space shuttle Endeavour for the STS-47 mission, six Japanese astronauts have left or <coughs> space from the Kennedy Space Center on board the space shuttle for totally 11 times. Mrs. Yamazaki will be the seventh Japanese astronaut. I cannot help becoming emotional about uh, the remarkable progress that Japan has made in the field of human space activities with the space shuttle flight opportunities. Astronaut Nongchi, the second Japanese expedition crew member, has been living in the ISS since last December. Astronaut Yamazaki will meet him at the ISS during this mission. For the first time in history, of history, two Japanese will be in space at the same time. We sincerely appreciate the support and cooperation of NASA. Finally, <coughs> I would like to conclude my remarks by expressing my heartfelt wish for a success of STS-131 mission and the safe return of all the crew. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it sure was a spectacular launch and, and a picture-perfect countdown. Uh, we, had, uh, we had really nothing to talk about, although uh, Pete will tell you we talked for a long time about nothing, uh, but that's, that tends to be our way. Um, we had, uh, when we came into count, uh, Pete had told me when we were getting ready to tank the vehicle about a, uh, a little glip on, on one of the fuel cell, fuel cell number two monitoring systems. It's a, uh, a measurement we call the, the H2, the hydrogen motor uh, status. And so it's basically a, a measurement that's trying to tell us the output of the, the motor that's spinning to pump. Basically, it's a, it's a hydrogen separator. So it's pulling water out of the fuel cell, pulling the hydrogen out of that water, and then spinning it around. Uh, and so it's a health monitoring of that pump. That's a pretty critical piece. If that pump floods and we don't pull enough water out, that water builds up in the fuel cell itself, floods that fuel cell, knocks the, uh, the electrolyte out of its cells and, and makes an unsafe configuration inside the fuel cell. So we're very interested in the health of that fuel cell. In fact, it was a measurement that was added after a, uh, an anomaly seen on STS-2. So it was added after, as an after effect to give us, uh, to give us a lot more insight into the health of the, the fuel cell. The problem is it's trying to measure the, the health of a pump by measuring its, its voltage and its current, uh, but it's also the fuel cell itself producing voltage and current. So you're getting kind of a ratioed measurement of the health of the pump plus uh, it's being tweaked by all the downstream loads that come on and off on that fuel cell. So anything on the AC current uh, makes that measurement change a little bit. And so it takes a little bit of detective work to figure out why it changed and, and to make sure it really wasn't a pump problem or vice versa, that it really wasn't some other problem that's being masked. And so the team talked a lot about what they, what they could do. We did a little bit of troubleshooting, adjusted the lighting to try to see if we could induce that signature again. But when the folks looked at the high rate data, you could really see that this signature didn't look quite like we had ever seen before with a, a lighting adjustment. And in t instead, it looks like a, an anomaly that's kind of been present on, on Discovery, it turns out, uh, probably since, <laughs> since it was built. Uh, it's shown up now. I think this is the third flight. Uh, the last one was STS-63, I think it was on STS-42, where there's just this momentary little change in, uh, in current status on the motor. What we think it is is a, uh, 
is a change in the instrumentation. There's some little impedance that, that gets into the system, makes that, that measurement change, drifts up high, and then it resets itself right back to normal. And that's what happened right before tanking. We never saw it reoccur again. We talked a lot about what we would do if we did see it reoccur again. The team uh, pretty quickly came to the conclusion that it was not a safety concern. It was not an indication of the motor itself having a problem or any kind of water buildup in that fuel cell. It was an instrumentation output. We couldn't prove that to ourselves, so we stuck with the LCC as written. So if that measurement did reoccur late in the countdown and was of a higher magnitude than we saw, it would have been a, a no-go condition. But that never did happen. And so, uh, so we did, again, we talked a lot about what we do if it happened again, got a really good story together, and the team, uh, the team was prepped. Pete's team did a, an, an outstanding job with that failure. Once we lifted off uh, on the way uphill, one of the main engines, the left main engine, uh, the high-pressure fuel turbo pump has three accelera accelerometers on it. They're there to basically, basically measure vibration levels. So if that turbo pump starts to have a problem, it'll vibrate a little bit. What happened was one of the three transducers got a little noise uh, on its floor, so it, it elevated the, the bottom, the platform, basically, the, the, the noise platform, and the, uh, the health monitoring system threw that out, said that's a bad sensor, and it disqualified it. So we went from a, a voting logic of, Three of three needed to, to be bad to shut down the engine. We, we dropped down to two of two needed to be bad to shut down that engine. Um, and so, but there was nothing wrong with the engine itself. So just this one transducer acted up, and the, uh, the voting logic threw it out to say, I'm not going to talk to you guys anymore, and I'm only going to look at the other two good sensors. Main engine itself was perfectly healthy, no problems whatsoever in the engine. Worked perfectly nominal all the way through Miko. Uh, so that was really all that we had. Um, the crew didn't get that enunciation. That's only detectable on the ground, so they didn't even know that happened, although they were reported to them uh, post Miko. Um, as Bill said, we had a couple little tiny foam events um, late after four minutes. It's uh, outside the, uh, the ASTT, the aerodynamic transport time that we're worried about, the critical time when the energy of a foam loss, if it hit the shuttle, would cause damage. Uh, so at four minutes, that's not a problem, and the sizes were pretty small. The folks will take a look, but, but first cut through you know, with, the, with the shuttle going up through Sunrise, we got a really good look at the tank as we went uphill, and it looked to be performing in fantastic shape. Uh, the folks at Michoud delivered us an, an outstanding tank. The, uh, the solid rocket motors from ATK performed flawlessly. The main engines, other than that one sensor being thrown out, did their job. Uh, workhorse engines, they've been, they've been doing their job ever since we've started flying this program. It's been amazing. Uh, and then the orbiter itself is performing flawlessly. So uh, we got word from the folks right before we came in here that uh, Ohm's 2 burn was complete. They're in a, a safe and stable orbit, and the crew's rapidly heading uh, through their checklist to configure the, uh, the, the, the orbiter from a rocket launch to the, uh, the space plane that it is in orbit and the, the, uh, the spacecraft to head to the station. So uh, I, I, can't, I can't even begin to say how proud I am of, of all the folks who got us to this point by bringing the hardware together, stacking it, building it, testing it, uh, and then today launching it and, and about to happen here in the next two weeks, going and flying the mission and executing it. It's going to be a, a, an action-packed mission with three EVAs, doing a whole lot of science, uh, and we're really looking forward to it. So that's all I have. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, well, it's really exciting and great for me to be here to, to report that we launched uh, successfully on the very first attempt. Um, I'm really, <laughs> given my previous track record, uh, I'm especially proud to have launched on the first attempt. Uh, you know, I'm really proud of this launch team who, uh, who makes a, an extremely complex um, task and activity of processing and launching this vehicle look so easy, and, and they really did do that. Um, as Mike said, the only technical issue we had was related to that uh, fuel cell pump motor condition. Uh, since we detected it uh, prior to the start of tanking, we did uh, take a little additional time uh, and delayed the start of our uh, external tank load about 32 minutes so we could do some uh, initial troubleshooting. And then we talked to verify that, uh, in fact, that we understood and, and properly were able to manage to the launch commit criteria. And as Mike stated, uh, it held steady throughout uh, the entire re remainder of launch countdown and through terminal count. Uh, late in the launch countdown, the Eastern Range reported uh, that the Jonathan Dickinson uh, tracking station, we had some communication uh, errors with the command message encoder and verifier between the, the tracking station and the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station uh, in the control center. And what they did was they switched from one communication string to the other one, reestablished the proper command uh, verification, and we were able to get that go. But we had a little bit of late communications with our, with our range folks about that. But it is important for us to make sure that we have that, uh, that good uh, communications to and from that for tracking purposes for the, for the mission. But, it, but we successfully overcame that minor hurdle. From a weather perspective, uh, 
uh, we talked a little bit about some patchy fog, and uh, fortunately it uh, never really materialized. The fog over the previous uh, few days had uh, been a little bit worse, and uh, fortunately all the conditions uh, aligned properly and weather was not an issue at all for us today. So uh, with that, uh, it was amazing to watch that uh, wonderful launch, and we're looking forward to an outstanding mission, as Mike stated, and looking forward to the planned end of mission here at uh, Kennedy Space Center on the 18th of April. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, before we get started, we're going to ask that you uh, ask one question and one follow-up. If there's time, we'll go back around again, but we just want to try to get things moving uh, this uh, Monday morning. So uh, please remember to state your name and uh, wait for the microphone. We'll take one, start in the front here. Um, Chris Gebhardt with NASASpaceFlight.com. Um, I guess one word that comes to mind after today is just wow. Um, and you know, great, uh, you know, congratulations all around to the, you and all the teams who got us to this day. Um, personally, I can't think of a better way to talk about how the teams take care of these vehicles than the extremely low IPR counts or interim problem reports that come up on these vehicles they're processing. And if I'm doing my math right, we have a record, a new record low number and set for discovery. Um, what was that final count? And I do have a follow-up. Final number was uh, 46, 46, and that is a record. Okay. Um, and also on um, on the fuel cell uh, on the fuel cell number two issue for Mike, um, is is that similar to what you were seeing on on the Atlantis vehicle for 125 and 129, just on Discovery and a little different configuration this time? I'm a little unclear on that. Yeah, it's a little different signature. It's the same sensor that we're talking about um, on Atlantis. It was more of a noisy transducer that it kind of it moved around a little bit and was bouncing, um, and that again looked like some some of the downstream loads that had some noise in them that, that caused an induction back up to that sensor. This was a, a different signature, but the same sensor. So it, it, it was similar, but not the same failure, if that makes sense. Let's go, let's go across. Um, Mike Schneider, Associated Press. I guess my first question is to Pete. I was just wondering, uh, given that this was the fourth to last uh, shuttle launch and probably the last uh, night launch, is there, uh, and also given the uncertainty of the uh, future of the U.S. space program, is any sense of either reflection or nostalgia uh, set in with the uh, launch team? Well, just speaking for today, everybody was just really all, all focused on executing the launch. I know that there was, as I was leaving from the control room to come on over here, it was, I was noting just a lot of elation and folks were just uh, immensely proud and happy and I didn't get any, it, it, not at this point at least, certainly in the next uh, coming days and weeks, I don't doubt that there'll be some reflection, but at this point it's, it's all in the excitement of uh, successfully executing the launch. And um, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Gerstenmeier, um, if you could give us any preview or sense of what you expect uh, President Obama to say when he comes down here next week, do you expect him to announce anything new or just reiterate what he said before? I really have no idea, so I, I, I've not been consulted and I don't know anything to speculate on, so. Bobby? Bobby Block uh, with the Orlando Sentinel for Gerst. Um, in recent uh, weeks and months, you guys have been doing some internal studies on heavy lift vehicles, and I was wondering if you could give an update of where that is and if there's any possible contenders that you see that could fit within the budget profile and uh, fill the flexible path? Yeah, I don't think we've got anything refined well enough to, to put a budget, you know, against it or see if it fits. You know, we've been kind of looking at just generic things to look at what kind of capabilities we need, what stuff we could put together, those kind of things. So the teams have been generically looking at things. We've also been trying to, to flesh out some of the flagship demonstration missions that are coming up, some of the other technology things, some of the other science things. So, so the team's been generally looking at things and just kind of being prepared, but there's no really specifics that, that we can really share or any major findings that anybody's come up with. And, and is there anything, I mean, there's a lot of talk about an all-liquid vehicle. I mean, is, are, are, you know, are the teams favor leaning in any particular direction? No, again, I think what we're doing is we're just trying to look at what mission we want to accomplish to be, you know, have a, a vehicle and a system that can support multiple destinations, multiple missions for us. We're looking at what technology we have, what technology we might want to develop in the future for the nation, those kind of things. So it's, it's pretty much a generic kind of uh, open study kind of look at things in a very broad sense. So we haven't really honed in on anything, haven't picked anything specific and then as I said earlier we really don't have the details behind it that really put it together as a program so it's more kind of a just step back strategic look at what kind of things should we be looking at how do they fit with the vision we've been given from the administration. Greg. Uh, Greg Dobbs from HDNet Television congratulations 
Uh, where, if at all, I suppose this is for Mike and may, maybe for Pete, where, if at all, do talks stand vis-a-vis -vis adding one more mission to the end of the schedule, adding what would amount to a fifth flight, a sixth flight, I should say, this year? Let's see, we still have the manifest that we've always had, and that is uh, that it ends after STS-133, so, so we fly uh, 132, 134, and then 133. We have STS-335, uh, the SRBs will be stacked, the external tank will be here, uh, and, and the orbit will be prepped, Atlantis will be prepped and ready to go uh, from a launch on need rescue capability. But, uh, but unless we have an emergency, we, we are not under direction to fly that mission right now. Uh, other than that, it, it's a political uh, direction from above, and I don't have any, any news for you that, that says we've been given direction one way or the other. We're still flying the manifest in front of us. You don't have direction, but is there a contingency plan if they say, yes, you can go with one more mission? Well, the, the, we have to be ready to fly 335 as a rescue mission. So from a, from a program standpoint, we will be doing all the, filling all the squares as if we were going to launch that vehicle, and we wouldn't turn it off until STS-133 Discovery was back safely home. So up until that point, we're going to be prepping as if we we're going to launch that vehicle. Would you dismiss the possibility of doing 135 without a rescue vehicle to go up after it? Yeah, again, you, if I go there, I'm going to be speculating and, and not telling you what, what NASA knows. It would just be my own personal opinion, and, and there's no value there, so can't help you. <laughs> Todd Halverson. Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today, one for Pete and one for Bill. Um, for Pete, you, you mentioned the record low number of uh, interim problem reports uh, that were racked up on this mission. I, I wonder if you could tell us what you attribute that drop to, and it seems to me that there's been a real downward trend in IPRs over the course of the uh, 18 um, post-Columbia flights at this point. And for Bill um, or Mike, uh, I seem to see the same kind of trend with in-flight anomalies. You guys aren't really seeing a whole lot of them. Um, uh, what do you attribute that to, and how important is it to the uh, the mission that uh, you don't have problems with the orbiters uh, in flight? Well, I'll start first, Kirst. Uh, you know, I don't know that there's any single thing that you can put your finger on. Um, I tell you, I am very proud of this team and how, how much it really proves how much diligence and uh, professionalism that this team, collective team across the agency, puts into processing the vehicle for flight because. It just really tends to show in not only uh, how safely and successfully we do launch, but just the few number of processing um, anomalies that we note both on the ground and in flight. Is there any single thing that, that we attribute to that? N not anything that I can think of. I mean, we have really rigid processes and standards requirements, and we tracked all of those requirements. And, and as I, I mentioned after launch, uh, we have such a, a, a huge army of uh, of um, unsung heroes of folks that do that uh, configuration management and uh, safety and quality and other mission assurance that helps our technician and engineering workforce execute the mission and get it done right. So uh, I think we're, if nothing else, we're just hitting our stride and we're doing it, doing it quite effectively. And I'd, I'd say on orbit, again, we're also seeing a very low anomaly rate on orbit. I think a piece of it is the maturity of the hardware. You know, we've flown this hardware for a while, so we understand how it works. It's also a tribute to the team that they keep looking at stuff. They keep trying to understand things better. You know, the helium isolation valve that we actually discovered last fall, and we didn't realize it in the data. We've now learned what that signature looks like that has this intermittent failure mode where it can stick open, which we didn't really understand before. So the teams have understood that. They've internalized that. They're going to go then make it even better the next time. So I think the, the folks have done just a tremendous job of looking ahead. You know, we pulled the carrier panels off around the window to look at Vespel fasteners. We're still looking for things. We're working hard. We're not giving up, and that's a tribute to the team. So the hardware is mature, and the teams are continuing to work and find things. And then going back to your other question is it's absolutely critical that this, this vehicle performs as well as it does. If you take a look at the EVAs and the spacewalks and the timeline of this mission, it is an extremely packed mission. So the fact that if we don't have to do a focused inspection, that will give us back three hours during the mission, which will be a huge benefit to us. If we don't have to troubleshoot any hardware systems on orbit, we don't have any minimum duration flight kind of issues, that's unbelievably important to us. So, so to succeed with the missions we've got, we need to have a vehicle that's performing just as well as the vehicles we've seen. So 
again, the overall team is doing an extremely great job with this stuff. It doesn't come easy. I think the danger is sometimes we start seeing that this is easy. This is not a big deal. What you saw today is a miracle. I mean, this is phenomenal. You know, you get inside 31 seconds, you watch all the pumps come online, you watch all the actuators move, you watch all the valves do their things. It, it's phenomenal. And, and that's a tribute to the team and a tribute to the vehicles and the folks that really work these systems. Tark. Thank you, uh, Tark Malik with Space.com and Space News. And I have a, a question, I think, for Bill and a question for uh, uh, JAXA. Um, for Mr. Christiermeyer, um, there's a four women, four female astronauts in orbit. There's there's the most the Japanese astronauts in orbit. This may be the last time you have 13 people uh, in orbit together. And um, I'm just wondering if you can kind of comment on kind of hitting these records now as um, maybe the, the, the most populous spacecraft is kind of retiring right now. Yeah, I guess if I, you know, I think about, you know, kind of the legacy of the shuttle program, the, the shuttle and station program have, have really taught us that we can work and live in space and and this is just a piece of that right is that you know we're seeing uh, uh, the four women on on board the the space station or we will after we dock and and we're seeing the two jacks astronauts fly so we're seeing you know uh, kind of a move away from from where space was a place we went to and did some some things to more we're actually going to go to space to do research and, and do technology that can help us here on the earth and also prepare us to go places in the future so I think this is a natural point in the program as we're starting to transition from from maybe the just getting to space was the big deal now it's not only to get there but we want to go do things and do research there and utilize microgravity utilize what we've got in space to discover more things about the earth that can actually help us here on the earth so we're going to get a chance to see some of that uh, return on our investment see some of that research come back to us so i think that's kind of the phase we're in right now thank you and for jaxa i'm uh, curious how uh, Japan is preparing for the re uh, retirement of the space shuttle and uh, its own uh, spacecraft like uh, uh, the HTV um, for future access to space station and possibly even future manned space flight. Thank you. <coughs> we have no idea of uh, human flight, so, but <coughs> we are now thinking to, have, uh, to develop uh, some uh, return <coughs> capability using uh, HTV now. Question here in the front. Yes. <coughs> Stefano Coliden with the Italian uh, Radio and Television Services. Um, two unrelated question. Number one is uh, now that you have, seems like uh, a mature system and that works and launches go off uh, pretty you know, smoothly, don't you feel like a sense of kind of sad irony that it's only a few flights before you have to close the program that now you seem to have this kind of uh, uh, performance almost matching the Soyuz that w they launch whenever they say they launch, they, they launch. And uh, theirs is a system that is 60 years old almost, uh, if you look at the design uh, time. And for the shuttle is almost 30. And so I was wondering how you, what, you must have some reflections about this and have an unrelated question. Bill, I can take that one. Okay, uh, and I can do a piece. Okay, the um, you know, uh, as Bill said at the beginning, this is a very complicated spacecraft, and 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 while we do make it look easy, it's certainly not easy to do. It takes a lot of uh, of care and feeding to keep flying the shuttle safely. Um, you look at its design; it's got some challenges in the design um, that make it difficult. That that if we went and redesigned a vehicle like shuttle, we would probably make some different design trades in it. So while we can continue to fly it safely, and I have every confidence in the team's ability because of what you just said, we're, we're hitting our stride. Uh, we're flying at a rate that's just about the right spacing. Uh, the teams are performing uh, very well, and, our, and our, our tools and our techniques and our knowledge of the shuttle is just constantly, constantly growing. We're, we're always learning. We have way, more better, uh, way better techniques right now than we did even five years ago if to analyze failures and, and, and how things like foam on the tank work. So. While we can continue to use it, it, it does. It, there is some irony in the fact that we're going to shut down at the peak of our performance. Yet the reality is, is in the budget world that we have, we can't continue to keep doing that mission plus flying station plus go beyond Earth orbit with a new system, and and it just becomes a trade at that 
at that point. And while it is painful and, and sad to shut down the, the one program that's flying, you, you need to do it so you can build the next program to continue on. So from that standpoint, um, it's bittersweet. It's, it's, it's tough to set it, set it down, but I can't wait for the next thing to come along because you know, that, that's going to be the, the future of, of human spaceflight. And I think also the mission has changed a little bit. You know, we truly needed the shuttle capability to assemble station. Without the ability to carry the large modules to orbit, we could have never built station. Now that station's assembled and built, we can then go to a simpler vehicle that is not as quietly heavily integrated or requires all the components and all the care and feeding. So we can actually design a vehicle or use a vehicle that's a little more geared to the task at hand, which is sim something similar to a Soyuz, where you can actually do crew transport, carry some small items up, carry some cargo up through our commercial resupply services. So again, I would say, you know, the shuttle has done its job well. It's established the station for us. It can now be a commercial market to go push for the new commercial providers to come and carry cargo. You can take some of the lessons we learned from design a shuttle, apply those to the new vehicles, and end up with a, a system that's a little more designed for the future tasks at hand. So, so I think it is, it is tough for shutting down the shuttle, but it's really served its purpose. Now it's time to move to that next generation of vehicle, learning, building off of what we learned here on shuttle. So we shouldn't put these lessons aside, shouldn't put the hardware aside, but we should take those, carry them into the next design, and build an even simpler system that's a little more easy to fly it for the mission that's needed. The other question is concerning the uh, communication problem that you had uh, that with the RSO. What kind of uh, command was that signal supposed to carry? I can't speak to the details of it. All I understood was that there it was that command mes message encoder and the verification. It was a it was a call it a talk back, if you will, between the Jonathan Dickinson tracking station and the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. That's as much in the way of detail that we got. And there is a launch commit criteria that verifies that we have good uh, those two good command message encoders and verifiers um, available and operable prior to launch and they were both verified on that second communication string. Hi, Mark Kirkman, Interspace News. Uh, this question is probably for Mike even though you said your opinion doesn't count. Um, but um, big picture, can you tell me, assuming nothing gets added to the uh, shuttle manifest, can either you or Bill tell me how this year is going to play out? And what I'm getting at is what happens as we move along with, with the orbiters? Are you going to continue to process all three orbiters as if you're maintaining the fleet, or are you going to, um, of all the part suppliers, like, like if you needed a helium pressure va valve or something like that, have all those vendors already been turned off? H how does this year play out if it stays as it's currently cut? Well, we've built a, uh, a transition and retirement plan that's been in, in work now for, for uh, 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 any number of years that laid out exactly that, that, that transition plan, looked at the spares we have on the shelf, identified the places where we need to keep vendors alive and, and procuring hardware, the ones where we have plenty of spares and we no longer need those, those suppliers. And so some of them have already been turned off in the, uh, in, the, in the propulsion element worlds. Most of that's all shut down. In the orbiter world, um, I, I don't know the numbers, but we've we've definitely turned off some of those supply contracts. Others we're keeping going because we do need to 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 keep going. Um, we talk about the the transition plan. Right now, the the general thought is that from a budget perspective, we're going to keep the fleet going because by the time you you land a mission, you do its down processing and you begin to safe it uh, for just to safe the vehicle before you even begin to prep it for trans uh, transport for display. Um, that timeline is such that each of the vehicles won't get very far down the path before we finish our last flight. So all three will kind of be up and running. They won't be fully up processing ready for the next mission. Uh, you know, Discovery will be the last to fly. Atlantis will be all ready, prepping to be rolled over. So Endeavor's the one that's kind of questioning as to where it falls in the timeline as to how far we take it. If you look at the missions and we fly them per the manifest, we will have basically finished down mission processing with Endeavor and maybe have gotten about three or four weeks into the, the safing phase so you know we won't go very far when you actually lay out the calendars it's not like we're going to have months and months where we sit around with an order and we don't know what to do with it so so from that standpoint we're not really keeping all three in pristine shape but by default they're pretty much staying there just because the way the schedule works out okay and just to follow up i, I hate to ask this but um does that mean the manpower w will, will stay the same at least until the final flight or do you see having okay we get to this point, this orbiter's theoretically not going to fly anymore, or these X number of people are no longer required, or are you going to keep the full from manning? A, from an orbiter standpoint, again, the, the propulsion elements, the ET, the SSME, and the, uh, 
and the uh, the the tank guys they're they've already ramped down and that profile's heading down pretty fast in terms of their workforce and their suppliers um, in the orbiter world that's we call it a, a step function where the processing teams and the orbiter support teams and all the hardware stays at a, at 100 percent until wheel stop of the last mission it's not exactly 100 percent it ramps down a little bit but looking at the overall picture it's close enough to calling it kind of a step function down so there's there's a small little ramp there but it's not a very big one and so that that force stays with us pretty much until the end uh, Jim Siegel celebration independent newspaper assuming that the president decides to continue his plan to uh, have all of the manned flights go commercial uh, what recommendation would you each of you have for the president to help in that transition from what we have today to an all-commercial uh, manned space flight uh, uh, strategy. See, I and don't. Part, <laughs> I, I don't think I. Boy, I, I, I'm not even going to try. I, I, yeah. yeah, I was going to say my my recommendation would be from a from a standpoint of uh, of capturing the lessons learned. I mean, there, you, you, starting over is always tough, and uh, every program, you know, just the the International Space Station is a fantastic example of. The, the vast quantity of knowledge we learned from the Russians uh, as we did the Mir missions and then moved into the station program, um, being able to take those lessons and, and apply them directly to the way we were building space station systems and, and ECLIS systems and, and all that stuff, it, you really, we, we bootstrapped ourselves way down the road. Same thing would apply as we move forward, right? The, the, the lessons of manned space flight are, are usually learned the hard way and, and you wouldn't want to lose those. Uh, and so from whatever you can, extract the knowledge that's currently in the team and apply that forward would be the, the, the basic recommendation I'd make. I was, uh, go Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say something along the same lines. It is in the, in the spirit of, of really trying to keep and uh, understand the core knowledge and then learn those things that are the, the lessons, the good and maybe the not so good, and then trying to figure out and apply them to how we can uh, design for operability and, and design for, uh, for simplicity and effectiveness. Jason Ryan with Space Fitcast. Um, this question may have been answered before, but I'm just going to check real quick. It seems like Discovery has chosen to fly more missions than the other orbiters. Now, is that because you guys are favoring Discovery for some reason, or is that just the luck of the draw? Let's see, I think Stephanie Stilson is the flow director, and she pays us a lot of money to, <laughs> to put that one first in the manifest. No, it's just the way it works out. Uh, you know, the, the manifest is a... Uh, um, I don't even know what word to use. Uh, voodoo kind of comes to mind. The way you combine up the, the turnaround processing, uh, the number of days it has to stay in the OPF, when a set of solid rocket boosters and tank are ready to go, the, the mobile launch platform, all the cranes that need to be moved. And so when you look at a manifest, what would seem like a simple answer as to which vehicle should be ready to fly next, it's never a simple answer. And just the way it's worked out, uh, Discovery's gotten a, a good share of the missions. OK. Uh, we have some time for a couple other, if anyone has any follow-ups they want to ask here in the front. Yes, getting back to the uh, command carrier, would that be a, a, a command, I mean a carrier that would carry also a destruct system? I, I told you as much as I've got with yeah. regards to the Yeah, I was going to say, from what, I, issue. from what I recall from, from my, uh, my previous <coughs> job, um, the, uh, we use that for telemetry and tracking uh, as a backup site. And the Air Force uses it as a range safety system, which which would put it in that range safety system command category. And I think they also use it for tracking backup purposes. Um, Chris Gephardt with NASASpaceFlight.com again. Um, for for the engine sensor uh, issue that you had today, was that the advanced health monitoring system that that discarded that sensor? Yeah, I can't. Uh, I don't know the specific. Uh, pedigree of whether that was a, a mod made for the advanced health monitoring or not. Um, I believe we had those uh, those vibration sensors ahead of time. I don't know if it was three of three and it was the same voting scheme. But I think the voting logic was part of the advanced that's health new monitoring system, but yeah. we, c we can confirm that offline. But I'm pretty sure it came about it in the sensor logic and deselect, I think, is some of the new logic that came as part of the new uh, advanced health monitoring system. And I, I kind of hate to shift focus away from 131, but uh, I know you got some work to do at the pad, normal turnaround and, and safing operations out there, but uh, where do we stand with uh, Atlantis's rollover um, in terms of what date are you, are you tracking for that one and, ma and mating to the tank? Well, right now we're, uh, the, the orbiter is in great shape. We completed the final orbiter power down and uh, we're completing the, the, 
external tank and booster uh, closeouts after uh, having mated the external tank last week. And uh, right now we're targeting rollover of the orbiter to the vehicle assembly building for stacking on uh, the 13th of April and then currently tracking towards rollout to the pad uh, probably the evening of the 19th uh, or m early morning of the 20th of April. Okay, Bobby. Uh, Bobby Block again for Gerst. If you were to move to a shuttle-derived vehicle, uh, heavy lift vehicle or moderate lift vehicle from here, how important is it that you need to keep flying the shuttle to make that transition uh, smooth and affordable? Or can you stop and then go to a shuttle-derived vehicle later on reasonably? Yeah, let me think of it. I think there's some real advantages if you can kind of keep moving from one system to the next. You know, we've got a plan right now as we, you know, we've spent two years or three years building a transition plan to ramp down the shuttle program. It wouldn't make sense to restart all that stuff again, as we've talked before, unless that was going to get followed on and carried into another program. You know, you wouldn't want to go, want to go back and restart production in certain areas that we've turned off you know, restart subcontractors, all that stuff, if that wasn't going to be another future. So that's a, you know, it's a different piece of your question. But if you're going to, if your vision is to continue on, then you might continue flying the shuttle. Is it necessary to go do that, or could you, could you kind of stop and then start again? You can stop and start again, but it's difficult to capture the knowledge when you stop and then, then move forward. So as smooth as you can make that transition within the budget constraints you have, the better off you are. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Tarek Malik with Space.com and Space News for uh, uh, Pete. Um, you, men uh, you mentioned how the, the shuttle launch uh, looked, I guess, to, to you, and it is, uh, I guess, the last planned one to launch at night. I'm just curious, uh, you know, Kathy talked it up a pretty good one over the last few days. If it met your expectations, surpassed them, what the team's feeling that uh, the rest of them are all going to launch in the daytime? Thanks. Well, uh, to me, it was it was spectacular watching it from the control room. Uh, I was curious. I thought we might see as uh, the the shuttle was going through the uh, uh, through its ascent phase that we might see some of the the uh, rays of sunlight on it. But I never saw. I did not did not note that as we thought it might have been the case. But still, every one of these launches are, are spectacular from my perspective. Um, and we'll have to see. You know, it's a uh, it, certainly at nighttime it uh, certainly lights up the the space coast really well. But but every one of them, you feel the rumble and you, and you, you just feel that excitement as that vehicle uh, proceeds through ascent. So I know we enjoyed it. Thank you. That's going to conclude today's news conference. To follow the STS-131 mission, stay tuned here at NASA Television. To follow us on the web, visit www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you and have a good day.